Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's 7 p.m. of Central European time, and welcome you to the Draft 10x10 YouTube channel uh, during this amazing uh, evening with amazing uh, guests. And I have the honor to welcome here the three time world champion and the current world champion, the winner of World Cup 2022, the player who is top one rated in a FMJD rating list, Rul Boomstra. Hello, Rul. <laughs> Pleasure to be here. It's a big honor for me to host you during this masterclass and welcome you, my dear viewers, on the chat and feel free to say a welcome word. Uh, I already see that Shaggy is sh saying that Boomstra is magic. Uh, Edwin uh, says, sure, we can learn a lot of tonight and I cannot agree with uh, you more. Uh, definitely it will be the fact because I already know that Rule prepared many interesting games in the interesting concept that uh, I will tell you about uh, soon. But Rule recently has shocked the world. In the beginning of the December, he announced the stop of his professional drafts career. And Rule, of course, we cannot avoid this topic during this masterclass. So I have to ask you why. Yeah, basically, I decided that there's more to life than, than drafts. Um... Obviously, during my, my playing career, I was already studying at university. Um, I studied physics and then in 2020, uh, I, I graduated. And that was the first moment that I thought, well, what, want, what do I want to do more in life? And then I decided to come back, play one more match. And now I decided to, uh, yeah, to take up a full-time job here in Groningen. So that will be a new life for me. A new life for you. So I will just uh, ask you one more thing. Uh, when was the first time that you was thinking about quitting, stopping the professional time career? In which year maybe, in which circumstances? Um, there's not one particular m moment, I think, um, except from when I graduated, because that's a, that's a normal moment to think about what what do I want? But usually I, I, I made a plan for the next two years or so, uh, till the next big tournament. Okay. So usually till the next World Championship tournament or next match. And then I decided, okay, do I want to go for the next, the next, the next, etc. Okay. That will be the topic that will be coming back, uh, I guess. And maybe you, dear viewers, will also uh, want to ask about that. So feel free to ask in the chat. So welcome you all. Hello, Marek Holender, Rul. Uh, hey, Rul. Uh, Siemka Damian. Um, welcome you in Polish as well. Uh, you already say that uh, for the fr for the fans, the duel between Fred and uh, Rul would be really interesting. I cannot agree more with that as well. Um, let's warm up a little bit before we start to analyze the games. You will start uh, to analyze the games and uh, show us your uh, br brilliance in this game. Uh, I have prepared the yes or no questions. So without asking, uh, you, without answering uh, with uh, more uh, sentences, just one word, yes or no. Uh, can I start with such questions to you? <laughs> yes, sure you can. <laughs> so first one. One day, Rule Boomstra will be the world draft champion for the fourth time. Uh, no. Okay. FMGD should be more active in creating an environment for top players. Yes. Mm -hmm. Drafts will never be as popular as chess. Uh, probably, yes. Okay. Uh, rating of 2500 is possible to reach? Mm, no. Okay. I regret that I made the decision to end my professional career so late. <laughs> no. Okay. I know what drafts need to develop. Uh, sorry, what do you mean exactly? I mean uh, that you as a person know what is needed for drafts to keep developing. Um, no. Okay. Uh, someday I would like to try myself in other areas of drafts, not only as a player. Yes. Okay. I enjoy playing friendly drafts games against weaker opponents. Yes. 
<laughs> I enjoy any draft game. So. <laughs> okay. Uh, to become the world champion in the tournament, you need not only skill, but also a lot of luck. No. Okay. Mm, I worked the hardest of all drafts players I knew. Of the new generation, yes. Okay. No one could ever beat me in a world championship match. Uh, so far, not. And no. also in the future, no one would. Be yeah, I give it. Okay. I will not play, so. So that was a little warm up and feel free to ask the questions to rule that I will ask him from the chat. Don't uh, forget to leave the thumb up and of course to subscribe the channel, my dear audience. And uh, rule, as I know, you prepared many interesting games and compositions that will be the main topic of this night because after all, this is the masterclass. Uh, and I uh, really enjoyed the concept that you told me about because uh, you want to show us the development of your draft skills during the years. And many people used to follow your games once you are Grandmaster International, once you are the world champion, but not many of them uh, followed the games uh, while you were younger. And uh, this is something that you want to show us. And uh, what is the first um, game that you want to analyze with us, you want to show us, uh, and, and why that game is chosen by you? Um. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, I, I wanted to cover mostly my younger years because most people will know the games I played recently. I think most of my matches have also been covered quite nicely on, on you can find them on YouTube, for instance. And the year I wanted to start in was 2007. So uh, I, I am born in 1993, so I was just 14 years old back then. And um, the first good results I got when I was 12, um, I won the youth category in, in, the, in the Netherlands um, until 13 or 14, I don't know how you count, the, the, if, under, under 14 I think yeah. it is, the mini cadets. Uh, but at 14 I started to play um, against some of the best players, and that's quite a young age to do so. And this masterclass will also be about my games against uh, mostly the world's best players. And in 2007, I played just an incredible amount of tournaments. I've never played as much since. I looked it up and I played 119 official games that year wow. as a 14-year-old. So just... Your record, yeah? Yeah, it's, yeah it's, it's probably more than the professionals that year or, or, or about equal. That year was also interesting because, as I remember, you, in such a young age, started in uh, Andus in Youth World Championship. And we played a game uh, with ah. each other. Uh, yeah, that's you... quite possible because I played everything. I, uh, I played European Championship Cadets, I played World Championship Cadets, I played World Championship Juniors as a 14-year-old. I actually took third place there. So maybe that's the year I played with you, or, or one year later. 2000, played, yeah. 2007 in Andusa, maybe it was uh, in France. It was 2007, 2007. Yeah, yeah, because yeah, I checked this game in Turbo Dam Base Base, and our record between each other is one draw. Ah, nice, nice. So yeah, among the 119 official games I played that year was one against you. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> but the game I want to show is actually a pretty boring game. So. Um, We'll go through it quickly, but it, it still was uh, a pretty significant game for me. Um, because it was the first time I played with Alexei Shizhov. And uh, he was one of my idols, he still is. Um, what was your attitude then, facing your idol oh, for the first time? That's a good question. Uh, I think I just wanted to play some good moves, um, see what would happen. Also, um, a couple of years later, I started working with Rob Clerk, and he taught me uh, the attitude that I had in those years, which is bas basically don't, don't try to not give them an inch. If you play slightly passive, uh, they will play more active, more active, and they will push you. So I tried to basically play a stable game. I can show you the game to see how I more or less approached it. So I, uh, I started at 3328, which I liked during those years. Um, 
and we, we got a pretty normal opening. Um, so this was seen a lot and, and still is. And Chichov went for one of his favorite lines, I think, uh, which is like this. And I wasn't familiar with this at the time. Probably I only knew this nice combination uh, after um, if it goes like this. This is one of the famous combinations uh, from openings books, mm -hmm. this idea. I think I knew such an idea, but that was about it. Uh, because White has a famous combination here. The, I don't know how you call it in English. In, in Dutch we say Coupe Napoleon. The same in Polish and in English I believe the same. Okay. Uh, anyway, Black uh, will sacrifice a piece like this. Give two more. And uh, now this nice move. Uh, to set up this typical uh, capture that will follow. And take five. Probably it's not winning, but uh, black at least gets an advantage if the king gets captured. Uh, so probably I knew that, but other than that, I wasn't really familiar with this. So I just decided to play stable. Um, I exchanged here. Um, and yeah, it's, it's hard for black to make a really interesting game here. The game went like this. Now I played a good move. I had already some positional understanding because I want after 12-18 I want to take this double exchange. Uh, but here this piece on 36 is slightly weak. So I decided to play a nice waiting move and only now take this exchange. It's not really... It's slightly passive, but on the other hand it's very stable. So even now I can... I think this change is okay. Mm -hmm. Would you would decide not... for the same move uh, now, if you played this game? Um, well, probably I would not exchange it to 29, because that more or less forces you uh, to make this, this exchange at some point, I suppose. Okay. I don't think I've ever encountered this opening afterwards. I did play it with black once, because Chiyov played it against me. That's something <laughs> that you see often. If someone plays it against you, you think, well, okay, it's interesting, then, then you try it yourself. Mm. But I don't think I've ever faced it afterwards. I don't know, probably... I, I, I would think about this, this move for sure, just to keep the position more closed. Um, maybe some, some waiting moves here as well to see what Black is up to. Uh, yeah, I, I would not exchange like this anymore. Okay. But of course, my first game against such a uh, such a high level opponent, I want to keep things calm cool, if I can. So I changed like this, and yeah, we played some building moves. I understood that the right direction is to go this way, probably to develop my uh, my position. If I weaken this flank too much, maybe you can start an attack there someday. So I tried to develop into the center. And yeah, probably to try and make things more interesting, he took this uh, two by two. Um, so now basically the only interesting thing about this position are these two pieces. And otherwise it's more or less, yeah, both on their own half. So it's a long building phase. Um, but what makes this game slightly special for me is that, especially in these long building phases, you need experience. And I was only 14, so I did not really have it. But I played a decent game. So we just build, build, build. Here I decided after this move, maybe now is the time to exchange. Still, it's the it's the most easy option, I would say, for white. It's more interesting to wait, but I liked to play the easy option, especially back then. Um, so if he attacks, maybe I can just play like this. I can also think about this. Maybe black gets something here. 
place. Uh, because black gets some space if it goes like this. Yeah, some activity on this wing. Yeah. yeah, so probably... It's, it's a pity that I did not wrote, write down what I planned. I only made small annotations about these games, like this was a better move or something. Actually, it's a good idea now to have some kind of diary of your thoughts during the Yeah, games. I would be really interested to know what my thoughts were. Yeah, if you knew that you would be world champion one day, then you could prepare it and now you would yeah. have a bestseller book, maybe. Just like a diary of all your games and your thoughts. But yeah. I only made very small annotations. So. And about this game, there was almost nothing in my database. But yeah, maybe this is slightly more interesting because my flank is weakened a little bit here. Of course, I get a lot of tempos in return. This might might be a way to play for black, I would say. But I, I also don't know how he approached the game because this was uh, during the Confederation Cup, which is a team tournament. Mm. And um, I was playing for Kulenborg at the time in a team of four. Um, and I think my teammates were Martijn Rentmeester, who was a talented player, I would say. And let me think. I think also Peter Steile, who was very talented. I remember he also played, him well, uh, yeah, yeah. I played yeah. against him my category, I guess. Yeah, he was... Uh, I would say a special talent. I also trained a lot with him, but then suddenly at age 19, he decided, okay, I want to study at university. And uh, he basically quit draws, at least at a uh, high level. Um, but our fourth player uh, was supposed to be P Pim Merz, but he fell ill oh. uh, during that time. So he was replaced by Hank Stope, okay. who, of course, is not such a strong player himself. He was supposed to be the coach, but he was playing. So we played against this top team uh, from Russia. And of course they knew, okay, we will win against Hank Stope. <laughs> so basically if you play three draws and win against Hank Stope, you win the match. So I, I don't know how hard Siege of tried in this game. And do you remember the re results of this match between your teams? Oh, I, I think... Uh, I, yeah, I could have looked it up. Uh, I, I think we lost, but only narrowly. Okay. We did reasonably well, especially uh, with one week weaker link in our team. But uh, it, uh, it was also because I played really well here in the tournament. I think Peter did well, uh, did great as well. It, this was the tournament uh, I played the best in in 2007. I won three games, played against three grandmasters. I survived all these three games. So maybe and, that uh, that was the crucial moment for you to feel your strength and to to develop. Uh, I, I think playing so many tournaments just helped me develop. Playing so many games against all kinds of opponents, that, that really helped me during that year. So we have the big advice for you, the drafts players who want to develop in drafts games. And also to develop, we can ask Rul meanwhile during this analysis some questions from the chat, of course. Um, thank you very much for all those questions and all the comments. Uh, Rul, what are the best books to learn plans and ideas? <laughs> Uh, yeah, that's one of the reasons Shishov is my idol as well. One of the first books I got uh, is the tournament about the World Championship in 88, which Shishov won by uh, a couple of points. And he played some amazing games in that tournament. So, uh, yeah, that's one of the best books that's ever written, I would say. Otherwise, uh, a very good book, uh, for, especially for beginners, uh, is the book by Michael Katz. Uh, strategy compass. I, I worked it through during my youth, and uh, yeah, it has some very nice concepts, uh, guidelines how to to play the game. I would say. Okay. So and other have... than that, especially in Dutch, the uh, we have these uh, you call it KNDB mappen in Dutch. Yeah. These uh, big folders, uh, yeah, full of material, and uh, yeah, those are. Uh, are very nice as well. Probably there are some new methods right now out there that I don't know about because they weren't there when I was young. I think we also have Tom Mentor now, but I haven't really checked it. 
Yeah, the whole program of uh, teaching players how to play in Netherlands, it's uh, great. And of course, I uh, speak to Rick and Esther and many things I would like to involve in Poland, for example, and uh, keep players developing. And you uh, were doing absolutely amazing job uh, during years and still it is now happening. Uh, on the chat, we have 58 uh, people. Please let me know on the chat, where are you from watching this masterclass with Rule Booms? and we are going back to the board. <laughs> I also had the luxury of having some very good trainers already at age 14. I think 2007 is also the year I started working with Alexander Boyakin. I was already working with Johan Kraaibrink, I think, and uh, Nina Hoekman was coaching me as well, so I had some really strong players already that were, were training me, which is also a big factor in what allowed me to develop. So basically we still have a long building phase um, and yeah here I played again the, the most easy solution I played this move uh, looking for the next exchange. I'm not really exchanging pieces uh, to, to, to exchange pieces all my Exchanges make some sense, but still, I, I, it's obvious that I tried to play for a draw somehow. So I, I decided that after this exchange, which is probably the most logical, the game might get interesting here with this construction against all these pieces. I don't really know whether black really has any advantage, but white should think about how to develop this position. So I decided to go for the other exchange. Uh, played this move. Obviously, black cannot take like this uh, due to this breakthrough. Uh, take two. So he had to take the other one, and yeah, I, I equalized the game. I wasn't afraid to occupy these two squares at the same time, and the game just fizzled out into a draw. much going on actually. So this was one of the very first yeah, encounters with a top Grandmaster for me and uh, yeah I did amazingly well I would say. And um, actually the, the year after I did much worse in 2008. Mm -hmm. I, uh, I also played a lot of tournaments um, but that's one of the years I, I I learned very much. I lost a bunch of games against the top players, but also in that year I had the opportunity to play against many of them. I, I could play in Zeeland. Uh, there was this tournament in Goes, uh, which had two master groups uh, with the very best players in the world playing there. Already in 2007 I played there. That, then I actually did okay. I think I lost one game, drew all the others. Mm -hmm. But in 2008 I was just getting crushed left and right. Um, but it also allowed allowed me to to learn so much. All of all of the games that I've played, I've analyzed um, both with the computer and with some some yeah, top trainers. And just by by playing so many games, I, I learned so much. Mm -hmm. Playing many games and, of course, analyzing them is a very important uh, part of um, becoming the better player. And uh, as uh, you say about the swings, for example, 2007 was a good year for you, 2008 a little bit worse. Uh, I believe and I know, I guess, the swings are unavailable in your sport career of uh, every sportsman. Mm -hmm. um, also, I have talked about you uh, with Ivan Antonenko, who is uh, trying to um, coach a Polish team. Uh, and he, he likes the aggressive style of playing. And he tells everyone, try to be aggressive because now if you play aggressively, you lose the game, you learn something. And if you play mm -hmm. the passive way, you don't um, learn anything. And look at the rule. He is always, <laughs> you are always an example for him that you played many aggressive games, you lost many games, but after all, while uh, at, at some moment you start 
stop losing, you started to drawing and then winning the games after uh, tension, after difficult moments in the games. And I believe maybe this is the uh, receipt for your success that you just tried to put the tension in the games, to play aggressively from the very beginning and you were not afraid of losing? Uh, I think I had to learn it. Uh, nowadays, I'm one of the most aggressive players, I think. But I started out as a pretty stable player. Mm -hmm. I think stability has always been one of my main strengths during my career. I did not lose that many games. Yeah, of course, I lost many games when I was young, but that's <laughs> because I was very young. But after that, I did not lose that much. But I think in 2008, um, also, I lost many games because I tried so many new things. I think it's important that you always try to learn new things, try new things. But it takes a while to incorporate them. If you train a lot, of course you learn new things, then you think, okay, I want to try this in a game, and then it goes wrong because you still don't know everything about it. Mm -hmm. I think 2007, I was just gaining in strength. And then 2008, I, I was still becoming stronger, but I, I tried some new things and uh, just got punished for it, but, but learned a lot in the process. Because I can show you my game from 2008 uh, against Ron Huysdens. Yes, I, and, as I uh, can see, we'll see it. Yeah, I already was a pretty strong player because in 2007, uh, I went up from a rating of 2100, which mm -hmm. is the rating you, you start with. I went up to uh, 2250, which is already quite high. Yes, yes. Especially at that age. But then in 2008, I was just stuck at that rating. So, uh, and, and this game is one of the reasons why I was stuck there. So the game started out um, like this. This is one of the moments I do remember, like how I felt during the game, because I felt somewhat annoyed. Mm -hmm. um, because I thought, well, okay, Ron is supposed to try to win against me. This was uh, in Zeeland, in one of the master groups. I was one of the weaker players. So the fact that he allowed this exchange I thought, well, well, okay, <laughs> it's possible to allow, I won't take it, but, oh man, is this the way he's going to approach this game? <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, probably it was a smart choice. And he allowed this many times, actually, also in game C, he probably wanted to win. It's just his, one of his favorite lines. Okay. But okay, I, I was there to learn, so uh, I had to play. Uh, I, I couldn't take this exchange because... Against Chichov, I took some exchanges, but all those were more or less to keep stability. But here you have a nice center, mm -hmm. and there's yeah no obvious reason to take this change, except to change pieces. That's the only reason you can take it. So, of course, I played like this. Um, yeah, nowadays, I would also consider uh, playing these two moves before 1-7 is played. Because here I have to take already a decision. Obviously, I cannot play this move uh, because of this one for three. Um, so, yeah, here this piece on, on, on 46 is getting a bit stuck, which is okay, but it was, wasn't really necessary. Um, but okay, I tried to set up uh, an attack on, on 24. And for all, of course, yeah, wants, uh, wants to see how I will play this. Um, so I set up this exchange. Um, but obviously, I cannot make this exchange now because of this one for two. So I have to make a choice. And the move I played here, especially in the next couple of moves, it just doesn't make sense to me. Uh, I played this move, which creates this weakness on, on 35. And it can be okay if you at some point uh, go to 33 very aggressively. Um, let me try to give a good example. Let's say the game goes um, like this. In such positions, um, it makes sense to have played these two moves if you want to attack like this. And now go to 23. Then you nicely develop to the center. 35 will at some point join the attack as well. 
Um, but the way I did it in this game, just looking back, um, yeah, it doesn't make sense to me. Uh, I would much prefer to play this move and then uh, on the next move exchange like this. Now I have no weakness here. Looks much more normal for white. With an interesting game, obviously black is not without the chances. Because there are still two weak pieces over here. But I played this move because I wanted to exchange to 28 and for some reason <laughs> I did not want to go to 24 too early. Probably I had seen some game of a Grandmaster. <laughs> <laughs> With this plan. Yes, but did not realize uh, how to do it exactly. And later, um, it's also one of the reasons I remember this game. Ron was very patient and he explained to me why I played a bad game. That, that was very nice because th that way I learned a lot from this game. Mm -hmm. So I tried to build my position and I hope at some point to exchange to 23. But yeah, there's just no piece on 18 anymore. So I can never do it with the exchange, probably. Um, I would look for a way. Yeah, the the problem is that it's not so yeah too easy to my to develop my position, because if I play forty four forty, he will go to twenty two, and now I don't have this exchange, of course, anymore. Um, and if I play like this, my position will have a lot of problems because I don't have this formation. I have some pieces here out of play. So I don't like this at all. If like plays like this. This looks pretty dangerous for me, I would say. So one way to solve my problems was to play 4440 and play like this. Probably I did not see it or I did not like it. I suppose I did not see it, because this doesn't look like a normal move. Yes. Um, but maybe Ron could have played somewhat more exact. Because the, the best position on move 510 is of course prohibited now, because of this uh, small combination. Um, it, is really, it is really tricky, and uh, that was the one of the questions on the chat. Uh, what do you think is the most important in the drafts game? Tricks, traps, combinations, or something else? If you start out, definitely tricks. Definitely. I mean, um, up until age 10, I would say you can win most of your games simply by tricks. Um, but the moment both players know most of the tricks, then of course it's more about positional play. And also, if you play a nice position elite, a uh, nice positional game, usually the tricks were favor. So mm -hmm. it will always be important to learn strategy as well. You can use the structures, formations that you have built to set up some tricks, traps for your opponent, and that works together. Do you think that uh, you well uh, cooperate between strategy and tactics? Yes, I think I started out mostly as a strategical player. Uh, but learn the tricks pretty well, uh, yeah, pretty nicely as well. Um, but I think there, uh, in general, there are two kinds of players. You see players that uh, are more tactical, and you see players that are more strategical, even at top level. I mean, for instance, I would say Schwarzman is mostly a, a strategical player. Chizhov definitely is a strategical player. Um, and Georgiev is much more of a tactical player, same as Jan Grunendijk, who is amazingly gifted at tactics. Mm -hmm. But but both both strategies work. It's just uh, yeah, what suits you, I would say. Really interesting. And and to become a top player, of course, you need to be uh, good in both. Mm. Um, so yeah, I could have developed my position like this. Um, and black has to uh, allow this exchange. Does win some tempos in the process, so it's it's also not a great exchange for white. Um, but yeah, I did not see it or did not want it, and I tried to play this uh, attack. Tried to take up more space in the center, 
Um, yeah, but now it's it's hard uh, to to find uh, my next plan. Uh, if I can make two moves, then I would of course play this. Uh, black plays a waiting move, and I go here. This is a really nice way again. But yeah, black will just not uh, not allow it. Um, if I play uh, 4440, he will be first to change. And here again, it's the question, what am I going to do with these pieces? So I decided, okay, let's let's wait. But still, he's, he's waiting as well, so I have to take a decision at some point. And later, um, Ron really nicely explained to me that this, that this is a really weak piece. Because I believed, okay, I have two weak pieces here. Um, but I, I saw many games with attacks and White had two pieces here. So I said, okay, it's two pieces uh, behind my attack. And uh, what does it matter that it's on 35 or around 40? But I found out in this game that it does matter a lot. And uh, yeah, got nicely outplayed. So this also is not a great move because uh, I give him more tempos. I thought I more or less split his position. Uh, and he has some weak pieces here, but it doesn't make really much sense because I have to go to 28 anyway, and all these pieces will come into the game again. So yeah, as you see now, these pieces uh, come back to life immediately. And I'm just stuck with these weak pieces. Now, I am not in great danger yet. Especially because black has this weak piece on 10 still. So it's still playable for white. But it's not great. So yeah, we have this long building phase. I tried to get 27 under control. So I went some tempos again. And uh, yeah, around this point is where the game gets more interesting again. Um, now, now it's time for the big decisions. And uh, yeah, immediately I made the mistake. Um, I, I played this move, and this is this move is very unlucky. Ron did not punish it immediately, mm -hmm. uh, but he could have almost won the game instantly, or at least won a piece instantly by by this exchange. This just gives me a, a big problem. I, I I suppose I had planned this move um, to develop my position. Uh, if he takes like this, I take back. I'm more or less okay. Probably still in danger, by the way. Um, black takes like this. Yeah, and this is very ugly for white. Um, there is a big threat over here. And uh, yeah, basically, I have no way of avoiding it except to give a piece because, uh, because here black will absolutely uh, crush me. This is just such a bad construction. Um, probably black has to wait for a bit. But because if, if you go now, it's too early. Because white can still uh, change black and hold the position. But black, black can simply wait and this, this will uh, go wrong for white. So I don't know why, why probably we both missed it during the game. Um, I should have played uh, either uh, 31, 26, uh, 27 or 44, 39. And uh, yeah, the computer actually showed me a very nice uh, variation to hold this position for white, which seemed crazy to me uh, when I saw it first. It goes like this. Um, White could exchange here, but yeah, you're still stuck with this weak piece on 40, one of the reasons why it's so much better to have this piece here. Because uh, if you exchange then, this position is just uh, probably better for white slightly. But now I'm still in, in, in trouble. But the computer played like this. And now uh, this is a very well-known idea. If white plays this, black takes surprisingly uh, this way and then takes this small combination.
Um, so it looks like white is in great danger here because there's an obvious threat, 1823. And uh, the only move to do anything about it, it looks like, is this move, right, Damien? Mm -hmm. But do you see what white can do? <laughs> it's absolutely amazing. I will try to find without looking at the <laughs> possibilities of the computer. Thirty-five, thirty. Yes, this crazy move. Mm. If the main idea is black takes now, you have this beautiful move. Twenty, uh, uh, thirty-two, twenty-eight, takes, takes. Black has to take three. Quite a surprise. Yeah, yeah. it was just amazing. I I can uh, thoroughly enjoy when the computer so shows me such things. Mm -hmm. And that's also been one of the main advantages I had over, especially over the older generation, that I was able to work with the computer every day from a young age. Obviously, you, you need to learn how to use the computer. And mm. you cannot learn only by looking at the computer lines. But the computer has given me so many valuable ideas like, like this. And if you are saying about the computer, um, maybe uh, you have your favorite engine to work with? Nowadays, uh, I, I work with both Kingsrow and Scan at the same time. Okay. Because Kingsrow uh, is the very best program at defending, and Scan, I would say, is the best programming, uh, program at uh, playing for advantage. Okay. Kingsrow it's always says, sometimes. well, okay, I will keep this position. No, no worries. Yeah. But Scan is more human, I would say. It, it, it worries about some slight disadvantages. It knows about subtleties. So uh, Scan is probably the best program to work with for for young players. Really interesting. But, but I grew up with Flits, which is a decent program, still about uh, world champion level, I would say, but but not as great as Kingsaw and Skin. Those those are much better than than I could play. Mm -hmm. So that's yeah, this could have been a, a nice defense. I played this move. Um, so, yeah, Ron made the mistake of playing 813 actually. Um, and we got into this position. Yeah, now I'm forced to play a really ugly tempo. Mm -hmm. I simply don't have any except this one. Because here I have to close as well. This, this looks even worse. Um, maybe also 1217, but yeah, this looks. Dangerous. Maybe 1217 is even stronger, by the way. So I played this. Um, and another thing, uh, in 2008, my calculation skills weren't that great. So nowadays, mm -hmm. I would simply calculate this position to a draw. But back then, I couldn't. I was just guessing, I would say. So I guess this move. Um, and went for this combination, which is panicky. There was no reason to panic, actually. I could play this. And uh, and, and the game should end in a draw. Uh, there's one nice line uh, if black plays so, so, so. And now I was afraid, I suppose, but I have this nice sacrifice. And uh, yeah, black has to give back to peace. And uh, the game will end in a draw. Uh, only it's best to take 18-23 with an immediate draw. Mm -hmm. But especially in time trouble, I did not have those skills yet. Um, so I was panicky. I thought, okay, positionally I was I played this game. I have to mm -hmm. do something. I took this combination, and especially my end game skills were uh, were poor. They've they've never been. Yeah, they've never been great, but now I can manage the end game. I still don't mm -hmm. really like it. When I uh, told the guys that I train with uh, from the Dutch national team, I said, at least I don't have to do the, I, I never have to do end games again. <laughs> because I, I just don't like it. There are too many possibilities. I don't feel natural in the end game. But I That's really interesting because, after all, uh, 
comparing you, for example, to Magnus Carlsen, who is the chess world champion, he is absolutely great in end games, and that is why he is the world champion, and he can calculate it immediately, even in rapid and blitz yes. games, and no uh -huh. one can play like he's playing. I, I think I can calculate great in, uh, in in six by six positions, for example, but a strategical four against two end game. Uh, both as kings, uh, it's just uh, really hard for me to remember all the tiny details and to understand the tiny details. Yes, because there are so many of those positions. And also here, I, I had learned basically one rule about the end games uh, uh, in 2008, and that that is you need your pieces at the edges because they're safe there. So, <laughs> so I went remember. to the uh, to the edge, but this is actually a wrong move. I had to go to the to the center. Uh, because after this move, uh, I think my pieces got stuck. So he makes a king, obviously, uh, threatens to take my piece. So I have to go. Yeah, and, and there's just absolutely nothing I can do with these pieces. They block my king. Uh, I have no activity whatsoever. So I absolutely had to go to the center if I take this combination. And... Uh, here I can at least put up a fight. Uh, the engines will say that this position is a draw, but it's really hard to make. Mm -hmm. um, leave the sacrifice a piece here and then go for some activity. Um, and now, yeah, 1319 isn't possible because of this two for two. Uh, after it's three against one is obviously not winning. So you have to go to this four against two, two end game, and uh, it actually is an immediate draw. Uh, this is one of the uh, the end game uh, things you absolutely have to know. I would say this is one of the uh, standard principles uh, you threaten with this exchange. Um, actually, black can go to twenty three. I see now. Prevent this exchange for a moment, but you will attack first. Um, so black has to go to 12. And this way you force, yeah, that, that the moves will be repeated. Black has to go somewhere in principle on this line. You go here, threaten again. Black goes back, you go here. So at some point black has to go here, and now you can just go. This is one of the main principles how to make a draw in four against two end games, I would say. But I, I'm not sure how much I knew about end games back then. <laughs> so yeah, I played this and, uh, and 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 lost without any chance. But I, I'm still thankful for Rome's lessons after the game. That was really nice of him to do. Even if uh, there are more. Uh, players uh, closer to your level from from those years that you're analyzing right now than your current level, we have to, we can, of course, uh, take something from your experience and uh, notice those conclusions, uh, which are really interesting and vital. And we are watched by almost entire world, uh, as I can notice, because I asked you who is watching, maybe someone joined, so <laughs> let me know. Hello from Ukraine, Estonia, Latvia, Cameroon as well. Wow. wow. Sudan, Israel, Netherlands, Lithuania, Warsaw, Poland, Russia. Hello everyone. And uh, you know what? I see what is the list of the prepared games by rule. And uh, I don't think we're going to ma manage to do it all during this night. So if you would like to see, uh, and maybe in the future, another masterclass with rule Boomstra, type one on the chat, <laughs> number one. If you are willing to see another masterclass with Rule Boomstra, and there is 59 people watching and only 33 thumbs be, uh, below the video, so you know the, the masterclass is for free. And uh, to buy this symbolic ticket, you have to click the thumb before uh, below the video. So please do it. And thank you very much for for uh, everyone who is doing it. And Edwin, uh, hello from and it's tough Dutch uh, <laughs> language. Vriesenvein. Oh, nice like pronunciation. 
Okay, and Cote d'Ivoire. So Ivory Coast is as well with us and many ones on the chat. Thank you, thank you very much. Anything else about this game or we are going further? No, this was basically, this game nicely sums up my year 2008, I would say. Okay, um, so we can go to 2009. Yes, that is the, 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 uh, the first break, real breakthrough in my career. Because in 2009, mm -hmm. I uh, qualified for the Dutch uh, Championship for the first time. I went through the semi-finals. Um, one... And you were 16 that year. Yes. Right? Yes. Uh, I won a really nice game in the semi-finals against Anton, Anton van Berkel, who qualified for the finals many times. Um, I, I won two more games, so I qualified convincingly. But this was the first big test in my career. Obviously, Dutch Championship is really strong. A lot of strong players were playing as well. Balja, Kint, Thijs, uh, Heust, dus Van der Acker. Yeah. Uh, Hans Janssen was playing as well. And then one of yeah, the, the relatively weaker players are then uh, Boudewijn Derks, very strong player, former World Youth Champion. Pim Meurs, former yes. World Youth Champion. And then I believe Martijn Vissers um, was playing. Jochem Zwering. Uh, but also they are strong players. And um, yeah, this is the game I played uh, against Van der Kooi. This is the only game I selected that was not against the Grandmaster. Uh, but th yeah, this is just such a beautiful game that I had to include it. Um, because I, I started out uh, very surprisingly this, this year uh, because I won in the first round against Alexander Balyakin. He made a terrible blunder against me. I won mm -hmm. with a very simple combination. He even resigned before I could take the combination. Oh. So it felt like I had not played the first round. I was finished after 20 moves because he made such a terrible blunder. So this felt like, uh, yeah, a, a new first round almost. And my first big test in this, this championship. And uh, yeah, it was a really nice game. So Wim van der Kooy, he also wrote many articles in uh, in Dama about opening theory, and uh, I had learned a lot from those articles. And uh, yeah, let me just so show you how the how the game went. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so he makes this uh, this this four clock construction, uh, but without a piece on fifteen, which is a, a kind of special construction. Probably it has a name in English as well. Do you know it, Damian? I don't. I don't know it, but uh, all those type of constructions are, are were always related to Tom Sabrans. Yeah, 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 definitely. Yeah, in Dutch we call it onvoltooid uh, hekstelling, okay. but uh, I will just call it special four clock or, or okay. something like that. Um, so I, I believe I've... that maybe maybe Tjalin Kudemut in his courses somehow described it with some English name, but I don't remember it. Yeah. If you on the chat maybe know how, how it's called in English, let me know, let us know. So I, uh, this is often played to invite White for this two for two exchange. It's an interesting game. Um, this is possible, uh, but it wasn't to my uh, to my liking back then, and and not even now. I, I prefer much to play against this four clock. Um, and we'll see throughout the game that he tries uh, to keep this this open. Uh, so yeah, this is a special move um, because the most obvious move is uh, 4137. Black, black, black has this option of uh, 1621. This is the most natural reaction and now it takes this exchange. And uh, yeah, probably take first here. Uh, and yeah, because black has developed this piece, one could argue that it plays easier for black. Anyway, I did not want to allow this. Um, so I went for this move. Um, well, usually it's slightly weak to go to the edge. Uh, but in this case, um, black yeah, more or less has no choice and has to exchange my piece. Um, yeah, so here you made the first slightly unusual decision. Um, often in most games, 
like takes like this. Mm -hmm. um, and there are some very interesting games here. Maybe I even knew one of those games uh, back then already. Uh, there's a famous training game from uh, Cybrons against Kraibrink that goes like this with very interesting play. Because uh, I especially knew a lot of games from Cybrons because from a young age I worked with Jan van Mechelen and mm -hmm. he had many editions of uh, Dalman, which uh, is a magazine uh, that that uh, Cybrons mostly wrote in and also some other guys, but he uh, was, I think, the main editor. Uh, so we just covered all these articles. And I, I know that training game is in, in Daman as well. Uh, so it went like this with a very complicated play. Yeah. And a very interesting game. Um, but in this case, uh, Wim van der Kooi uh, took the other one. And this is somewhat less principal because uh, if white wants to, he can exchange here. So exchange like this uh, with an open position, uh, somewhat easier for white, I would say. But uh, yeah, I was ready for the fight. And uh, I, I think I simply believed in my position. I have a nice center, so uh, I wanted to keep my center. So we're in a building phase again. So I try to take some tempos. Um, here is the first move that I probably would not play anymore nowadays. Uh, I played this move. I don't really see why this is a logical move. Uh, probably I thought something along the lines that, uh, I mean, the most natural is to develop uh, 46. So this seems like the most natural move from to me now. But maybe I saw that if I play 41 here, black has this option of going 16-21. Because now I cannot go to 26 because of this uh, this shot. Mm -hmm. So probably I saw that, uh, that option and thought, well, maybe I would have to play 49 here anyway. So. Cover the gap. <laughs> so I just started out to cover this gap. Probably it doesn't really matter. Uh, so he goes for 1 6. And yeah, now we get into this uh, interesting position. Uh, white occupies all the central squares, and black still has this uh, special four clock construction. And um, yeah, this is one of the cases where I would really like to know my thoughts back then. Uh, because the most obvious move for black is to wait. And now white has a huge choice. Um, the, the most normal move is to play uh, 47, of course. This is what you almost always see uh, built this nice formation, which can be useful almost always. For instance, if 11 17 is played, you have this standard shot. Um, like this, where you you yeah you immediately see the benefit of this formation, and uh, uh, now this winning the game, take one here, take two, etc. Um, so you basically force black to play ten fifteen, then you can go to twenty three, and. Um, now, positionally, 410 is a really bad move because you can never play 1319 again. Uh, in this case, it also uh, loses tactically um, because white can take this nice combination. Again, using this formation, by the way. Yeah. So, this, this, take two. And uh, go all the way to king. Uh, so that would be really bad for black. So you force black to play 1319 and white can just open up the position uh, like this. Um, and yeah, this is one of the 
standard new positions, I would say. You see, I, I believe you see this more often now, where black occupies both edges, white is in the center. But it's not so easy to uh, to understand where to go next for white. Um, yeah, you, you simply don't really have any space to go to. Obviously, black's position, a uh, white position should should be somewhat better. But nowadays, you, I think you see more often that players try to play such positions with black as well. Yeah, because sometimes you wait, just not uh, being uh, careful enough, yeah. and you get the classical position. It's, it's very important. Opponent has two corners and problems. It's very important also that black controls this this square. If white can get there somehow, it will be a good position for white. But since that's not clear, you know, it might become classical. Uh, black might be okay there. So yeah, this is. Not that easy. And and also black has some tactics. Um, so 913. Let's say this move to develop. Um, this is, for instance, one of the standard combinations. Um, where you see that these edge pieces can have some function as well. Mm. Make a hole here, go to king, and uh, take three. So yeah, if if white has to go into this four clock again, it's always a question: what is it? What is it exactly? It's, probably it's strong here uh, because it's not easy for black to to control this position. But, in such positions, uh, if I can ask you, um, if you cannot calculate everything, because sometimes, of course, it is impossible, how do you judge the position? This is uh -huh. some kind of intuition of experience? Usually a combination of intuition and experience, yeah. And you, and you try to make some short calculations. Uh, like, for instance, here, uh, so my, my first uh, guess to play with black was like this, which didn't work mm -hmm. probably because of... Uh, 34.29 and, and white is okay, or, or even better. Uh, the next thing I would do is calculate this and just simply try all these very small variations to see how does the game go, uh, mm. what direction are we headed in, and then uh, at the end of the variation you, you try to judge the position yeah. by, by experience and intuition. There was a time that I was following your games and trying to understand what you are going to play and you chose the variations that I would never <laughs> choose because I would absolutely not feel uh, comfortable in such uh, positions. And yeah, this this may have been one of those cases if if it yeah. uh, if the, if he would have played this move. I think I was thinking about this move, which looks absolutely crazy. Yeah. Because you make this this hole here uh, but it has some function as well, because I can first show you what happens in the game. He played 11-17, uh, and then I had this really strong exchange to 21. And uh, yeah, this is one of the basic strategical concepts. If you control these three squares, you usually limit Black's options greatly. There's just no way, nowhere to go for him. I mean, uh, just to give a very simple example, if you were to go to 22 or, or play 6, uh, six eleven is not possible. I mean, uh, you also or, or uh, you always have these small tactics that work in your favor for white because of this strong piece on 21. So black has to take, white takes, and you take 2 to 6. Yeah, this usually is a very strong construction. So that's why uh, also here this is an interesting move. Because the moment black goes to 17, you can go to 21. So I think I was, during the game I was thinking about this option, but probably I wouldn't have dared to play so. Because I, I was somewhat scared of new positions back then, and, and still am. I, I like positions that I know, that I've analyzed a little bit, uh, that I'm familiar with the concepts, and this, this is just completely new. 
because but sometimes maybe the, maybe there is a part of joy from creativity yeah of so, course of course but i i like slightly new positions okay where i know the basic concepts it's still new but i know uh, more or less where to go so yeah this is this can be very interesting and wait one more move uh, so if 1117 is played you go to 21 with the same concept obviously you've weakened your back rank with with white but still this should be a good position for white i would say the most interesting is if is if black plays for 10 but now yeah big complications can start because black can never play 1319 but on the other hand white white has some yeah ugly construction here as well if this piece were here Black is uh, white is winning. You you don't have to look almost. But here, um, the position is actually equal. But uh, yeah, the variants are are very complicated. I see the variant three. Yeah, there's there's there are some fantastic possibilities. I looked at this this morning. Um, which one do you mean here? I mean all the three, how many ah, variations do you Yeah, have? yeah, the three. Ah, I thought you the third variant. <laughs> That's the three. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, there was one really nice one, um, which I'll just show you. I mean, uh, it's very interesting to analyze this uh, position uh, with a computer, but probably it won't add that much if I cover all the possibilities here. You can just look yourself and uh, enjoy the possibilities. But there's one I want to point out because it's so beautiful. Uh, and that was after 1721, I believe. This actually is not a great move because uh, white can now change back. And the longer white can wait, uh, the more problems black gets because he cannot play th uh, 1319. And I think the fantastic combination was in this variation. So the position uh, gets complicated again. Black has a lot of choices. Um, so bo bo both colors are, are very limited in their options now. And uh, the amazing possibility that the computer pointed out <laughs> was this. <laughs> And now a fantastic combination for whites that unfortunately isn't winning. So it went like this. Now an absolutely amazing idea with uh, 32, 28, take two. Of course, the mover of the first choice. Yeah. 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 <laughs> this is just <laughs> absolutely <laughs> magnificent. Oh. <laughs> so black can take in a lot of ways. But of course you have to take the most, and there's only one way to take five. So black has to take five. White takes two. And now you take four again. So that was just absolutely amazing. Unfortunately, it's, it's a king for two pieces, which usually is good. But in this case, it's, uh, it's not winning, because I suppose yeah, black has some counterplay connected to 2025. Um, so yeah, it's unfortunate that it isn't winning, but uh, I just wanted to show it because it's so beautiful. It is. Sometimes I believe that you use some ideas from the combinations uh, and from the, from the games uh, to create some compositions of yours. Yeah? Yes, I really enjoy uh, making compositions sometimes. Yeah. And uh, if we are uh, near your job in creating something. We have questions from the chat. Uh, are you planning someday to write your own book? And if you would like to write something and create some book, what would it be about? Oh, probably it would be about my best games. Uh, I enjoy explaining the thought process in my games. Uh, I enjoy, show, uh, enjoy sh collecting my games. Uh, analyzing them, for instance, I, I analyzed this game this morning a little bit and found this amazing possibility. Then, mm -hmm. yeah, that that just gives me so much joy. So probably it would be about that, but I'm not sure if I really plan to. There are just, yeah, there are so many things I would 
like to do connected with routes, but I have to, yeah, make some, I suppose, at some point. Mm. The way how you are explaining how you play and uh, how you follow some variations and moves is really understandable, which is a big value. So I believe, and I hope with all the viewers, perhaps, some days you, someday you will decide to, to to write a book about your games it will be absolutely amazing meanwhile dear chat because other people are joining and i'm really glad about it don't forget about the thumbs and um, i will ask rules soon perhaps uh, after some break that will be coming soon um, about uh, one uh, top grandmaster from the world uh, and if you could imagine the question to the chat the best ever match for the world championship title who would be the best opponent of rule boomstra please type in the chat and after your um, uh, answers i will calculate who was the top from you from the chat chat and we'll talk uh, with rule about this possible uh, imaginary opponent and going back to the game yeah so i suggest we just uh, finish this game and then uh, we go for for a break um, so he played 11-17, which is uh, a positional mistake, I would say. Mm -hmm. So I exchanged to 21, and only now probably he understood that this is a very strong position for me. So he decided, or he tried to, to, to limit the damage by going for, uh, for this. So next move, he will take my piece on 8, and at the very least, he got rid of the strong piece on 21. Um, but the problem he has is that in four clock positions, um, you always want at yeah to develop these pieces. And now there are simply four of them stuck there. So that's just too much. If this piece were here, he would be OK. He can develop nicely. Uh, wait a minute, my mouse somehow got stuck um it's okay. so yeah he has to try to develop these pieces but it's very hard to do so because you don't want to go to 22 um at this point you get limited severely here with black uh probably you will get absolutely stuck unless you go to to 30 with 10 15 and uh at this exchange but that's also something you don't want so it's pretty unclear what he should do here. Maybe 1721 is the best option. Try to develop this way. But he went for 28. So I tried to limit him even more. And now I just wait till he has to make a decision. And uh, yeah, he's in a lot of trouble here because 1721 looks the most normal. Um, but actually, this move is already losing. He did not play it uh, because he saw that this is losing. Uh, I just wait, take this nice square, and this is another standard combination. Uh, white can take many combinations here, but this uh, is the best. This is also a combination that you often see in four clock positions. First, you force black to take to seven, and then you use this piece to go to king. Um, so, uh, let's see. White just plays this move. Uh, 10 15 is forced, and now a nice idea is winning for white, uh, which is this exchange. This is slightly non standard or even highly unusual, I would say. Uh, but it's working perfectly. So 1419 uh, isn't possible due to this. Mm -hmm. And after 410, which is the only other move you have, you simply play 3530. And again, black has absolutely nowhere to go. All the moves uh, are punished by a small combination. Beautiful. So this is really nice how you can combine strategy and tactics. Mm. Um, so yeah, this move isn't any good for black. So you have to play 10-15. And uh, yeah, 
get here. Uh, so we have the same combination here. If it would be like this. So this is the one I also showed a minute ago. Again, you force black to take back, and then the one for three. So there was no uh, no option for him anymore. He had to go to 30. No choice, very bad move, but yeah. If you have to, <laughs> there's just nothing else. Um, and I remember being very nervous here because I understood I was winning, but it was the first long game that I played in the in the Dutch Championship. And uh, at the end of the tournament, my nerves also got the better of me because I won the first two games. I did really well. I played, uh, let's see, I played 10 draws afterwards, but it were pretty good draws. I was never in any trouble. I had some chances to win more games. At least I had nice positions, not winning, but I had some chances against Jochem Swering, against Jeroen van der Acker. Mm -hmm. And then the last round, I had the chance to get the, to to catch the leader. I think Ron Huysens was leading going into the last round, and uh, Baljakin and me, we were following him one point uh, down. And after twenty moves, I won a piece against Sven Winkel, but I just couldn't convert because I was so nervous and so tired. It's it's uh, easy to underestimate how. How exhausting these tournaments are. We we had 14 players, so 13 rounds, and I was just spent. And especially the combination of nerves and fatigue, that can be just mm. killing. And after all, you were a young guy. Yeah, it was uh, the first time I good played. Good condition. I, I I had no experience uh, with such long tournaments, but uh, okay. it was a very important tournament to me because after. This tournament, it felt like I belonged at that level. I knew, I, okay, I can compete with these guys. So that was the moment? Yes. When the beast was born? Yeah, that was the start of a nice career. About thinking of winning during the game, during the position, do you have something like, okay, I have the winning position and nothing can break me down and I will just hold it? till the end, or you don't think about the result at all and you just try to follow the best moves you can uh, find? It, it's better not to think about the result at all, but that's hard. But is, that's really is it possible? Hard. No, it's, it's really hard, right. but the one thing that I've learned is, uh, let's say you have four minutes, for instance, you have a bit of shunt or shunt time shortage. Um, it's worth it to spend one minute to calm yourself down and then to think three minutes with a straight head. That's worth it. Really interesting. If you think four minutes, but you're just thinking panically, it, it won't really help you. So one of the things that I've learned is just to take sometimes, let's say, 10 seconds or, or even a full minute to calm yourself down, to think, OK, let's get calm, and then I will start calculating again. But it's hard to do. That's maybe something from the Buddhism or something like that, because uh, I've read some books uh, where wise men told that once they had to solve the complicated situation, they just imagined that they are uh, orange juice ah. with the parts of orange inside. And they tried to make it visible in their heads uh -huh. that all everything is just going down and the juice becomes clear. Uh, yes. Yeah, and that's the process of you getting uh, calmer and uh, trying to play yeah. best. Uh, yeah, I also the, got the, the advice to envision a stop sign in my okay. head to stop the panicky thoughts, but it never really worked for me. Okay. Uh, breathing exercises, those did work for me. Yeah, because it makes your blood pressure, for example, yes. to go down. Yeah? Just to focus on my own breathing, that will calm me down. Maybe those are the topics that should be talked more often even because sometimes we don't control our emotions and perhaps this is the really interesting part of the game because we've had also the question on the chat, uh, how do you stay concentrated during the game? Because after all, it's not easy to give your best during the game that lasts, for example, a few hours and to become um, concentrated all the time. Yeah. 
it goes in phases for me. I mean, my concentration is much better when it's my move. Uh, then I will okay. think much more in terms of variations. And when my when it's my opponent's move, I will much more focus on general concepts. And my 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 thoughts are a bit more loose, I would say. And of course, there are only a few m moments in a game you have to be absolutely concentrated. I mean, in the middle game, you usually have one very important move in mm -hmm. which you have to calculate everything. But mostly you're just thinking about long-term strategy, I would say. And, and you're contemplating your options. For instance, in this position, I have two strong options. Uh, I played this move, which is a good move, I would say. But I can also make this king shot. Um, which is also strong, uh, but you're just yeah trying to calculate some very small lines, and then mm -hmm. try to make a decision. I think I made a great decision uh, because I don't really like to play with kings. That's uh, the first, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, part of my process. And the second is I'm absolutely convinced that this should be positionally winning for white. So I just went for this. I thought, well, this should be winning. But here I, I did not make the best choice um, because I got a little bit scared. I, I knew, okay, the best move should be this, fixing these pieces. Um, but I just yeah didn't dare to do it. And I also couldn't calculate the right variations here because I did not have enough experience um, yet. It's, it's hard to make good calculations in such a position where it's not really clear where both sides need to go. So this this 8-12 looks normal just to, well, at least give Black some options. And especially in such a position, um, I, I, I learned a lot from working with the computer um, in these kind of little bit strategically unclear positions, but where you can calculate short lines. So the computer uh, actually indicates a positionally bad move here for white, which is very strong, 4440, mm -hmm. with the uh, simple tactic of 913, giving two pieces. And now this piece is beautifully placed, taking five, winning the game. Um, so this limits black severely. Uh, because yeah, black actually has to make this move at some point. So you can first change back, you go again. Uh, and now another yeah, killing blow, this move. But yeah, back then I definitely couldn't calculate these lines. Nowadays I might succeed, but it's, it's really hard work. Because also this is, positionally, lo positionally speaking, it's not a logical move. These pieces are disconnected. But tactically, it works out, yeah, beautifully. Black cannot change back because white can win in two ways. Uh, this is the most stylish. Go here, take four. Uh, take uh, two fifteen. And uh, yeah, the other small trick, knight thirteen, give here. Doesn't matter how you take, you will always win playing with uh, the piece on 33. And finally, 10 15, you exchange here, threatening to win this piece. And uh, there's no defense for black anymore. If he plays this, you simply wait one move and win the game. But yeah, I definitely couldn't make those calculations back then. So I decided to go for this, which also looks very strong. Uh, but actually the computer, yeah, they say this might be defendable for black with 10-15. And now an absolutely crazy move that's hard to find for human players. Oops. So this is, yeah. This is a, this sets up a bit of a trap because if you take the one for two, obviously black prepared this. Uh, take two, take two. 
and uh, maybe black is even winning. And it also sets up another trap, which is much harder to see. If you play this move, the computer will make a draw with this combination. And at first, this doesn't seem to make any sense because you want to play 12-17, but you simply take with the piece. But he plays this move. And yeah, this apparently uh, doesn't win for white. Um, so yeah, the finish could have been a bit better, but uh, at least I, uh, yeah, it was a very good game from my side. And in the game, I won also very convincingly. Um, it went like this. And yeah, this is just an absolute mess for Black. He has all these weak pieces here. Mm. So uh, yeah, this was one of the very best games I played uh, when I when I was uh, still a junior. And from that moment on, I was one of the uh, strongest players in the Netherlands. And once you are one of the strongest players in Netherlands, you are one of the strongest players in the world. Uh, because, of course, the Netherlands is one of the strongest country in the world. Mm, this is the game after which we'll make a short break. But before the break, we'll have a little uh, chat. Uh, in the, um, on the chat, we've had a nice question that I have also uh, prepared for you. If you would have the possibility to challenge and play against some of the old grandmasters that are unfortunately of course already dead uh, from the years let's say 1960 to 1990 who oh. would you face wow that's uh... obviously it would be very interesting to play chichov at his prime um mm -hmm. i think he was playing amazingly but i've also been a big fan of the games of alexander dipman i would be very it, uh, yeah, it would be very interesting just to talk to him, not even play him, but... Um, mm -hmm. he, yeah, he played so many nice games, nice strategical games with new strategical concepts. Uh, I've always really admired his games from uh, the World Championship uh, 86, where, where he won, of course. So probably it would be him. Really interesting answer. Uh, I did not expect Alexander Dibman. Uh, some bonus questions before the break. L please tell me who, in your opinion, is the best drafts player in the history ever. Oof, yeah, that's the tough one. <laughs> <laughs> um, if you, obviously, I'm a bit biased towards Georgiev because he was the leading player uh, during my, uh, my career. Um, but yeah, you can make a, a good case for either Georgia or Chichov. I think all other players are out of the question simply because they won 10 and the next one in line is probably yeah, both Cooperman and Weersma on 6. Yeah, maybe Isidore de Weiss yeah. also has 7, but that's a really long time ago. It was difficult to calculate and to uh, it's, it's, it's hard to... I think uh, Chichov was extremely dominant during his best years um the way he won in 88 the way he won in uh, 92 especially 92 was absolutely amazing um but georgia has the winning record against chichov so <laughs> so if they faced in their top you think chichov would be the one most favorite to win against georgia top chichov versus top georgia um well, uh, I think in 2003, both were basically at their top. Yeah, you, you'd have to ask Chijov, I suppose, how his form was back then, but he was still playing absolutely amazing. And Georgiev managed to beat him in a match. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and yeah, that was an absolutely impressive match. Um, but yeah, both of them are, are such strong players, it's really uh, hard to pick. If they collected 10 titles, definitely they are. I asked the uh, chat before about uh, the player that they would like to see playing against uh, you, for example, in the world title match. 
Uh, it's not a big surprise that it is Alexander uh, Alexander Georgiev, but this is maybe the topic that we'll um, uh, bring back after the short break. Uh, just before the break, start one last question. Which coach do you think did give you the most? Oh, yeah, it depends on coach or trainer. Um, the trainer I learned the most from is Alexander Blyakin, simply because I... I worked with him for such a long time and yeah he learned me so so much and uh, the coach that has taught me uh, uh, the most is Rob Clark I've also worked with him the longest and uh, I had an, uh, a very special relationship with Rob um, I think we were yeah, perfect for each other okay. and uh, it has always been an absolute pleasure to work with him the line of the communication, the atmosphere during the work? The atmosphere, the the change between seriousness and lightness, it was just yeah, perfect for me to, to play my best. So I was very happy that he was there during my three-year World Championship matches. Big color. Thank you very much for those answers. And as I know, you prepared something for the viewers uh, for the time of the break. You will have the possibility of solving what? Ah, I prepared a, a small composition. Uh, it's actually one of the first compositions that I've made. So I thought it would be yeah, nicely connected to the games that I've shown. It's uh, from 2010, so uh, about the same year as I played this last game. So, uh, yeah, good luck. Good luck during the break. Uh, remember to leave the thumb up below the video and we'll be coming back in about 10 minutes. So don't go anywhere and just focus on the position prepared by rule and see you in a few minutes. And here we are back uh, in the middle of this beautiful journey of Rul Boomstra to become the world champion and then to win this title for the second and the third time in his beautiful drafts career. Uh, we know how it all started and now we'll be going further with analyzing of the games and during the break you could have um, uh, solved the position uh, the composition of Rul Boomstra. I don't see any mm, solutions in the chat. Uh, I honestly will say that I spent some time on it and I don't see the solution but maybe some of you did find how to win it. So Rul, I believe that we are we are all yours to to show us how to win this uh, composition that you are really satisfied uh -huh. of. Yeah, it's actually my, one of my very first compositions. I've never published it because, uh, as I later found out, Harry de Waard has made some similar compositions. Uh, but the idea is slightly surprising how how white wins. So you first give this piece. Black has to take. Give another one. Black has to take. And this is where the slight surprise comes in. Um, you give Black a kick. Oh. It's starting to look somewhat hopeless for White. 
but uh, yeah, this is where white uh, gets into action. And it's sort of a double combination. First 50 takes three pieces and then you take another three. And three more. And what I especially liked um, from this composition is that it's after the combination you still have to play well to win the game. And especially the move you have to play at this moment, I really liked. Because it would be most natural to stop 28 um, with your king, for instance, playing 415. This looks really natural, cutting this, uh, this road to king. But there's no way white is going to win this position anymore. And it looks so the right thing mm -hmm. is to go to with the piece 47. Yeah, it looks like this is a really good defender, but you have to play uh, with with this piece to win the game. So yeah, black has no choice. Um, if he goes here, you simply win this piece. Uh, so he has to go to the uh, to the other side, and now you attack with uh, yeah sharp ending. Uh, so black threatens to exchange, white has to block this exchange. Well, um, black has no choice. And now attack. And go back. Winning the game. So black can take like this, take two, or take the other one. And white is just in time to stop this last piece. Really beautiful from the very beginning till the end, uh, like the end of professional <laughs> drafts career of Rul Boomstra, who is my and your guest during this uh, masterclass. We are going to next uh, game that will be analyzed by Rul. Meanwhile, uh, let me ask you uh, another question, because um, as we all know, in 2022, the war in Ukraine started and uh, it uh, made... Uh, Russia and Belarus suspended mm -hmm. in international yes. draft tournaments. And how does it affect you as a player? Because the competition is less than many grandmasters, best grandmasters in the world are not able to play in the uh, most important tournaments. How do you find it? Well, it's a terrible situation, of course. Um, I'm also uh, in contact with Artem Ivanov and he told me some stories. Uh, about, well, he's, he's um, living in the west of Ukraine, so in the relatively quiet part. But still, those stories were, yeah, frightening to hear. Um, and also for the trials world, it's yeah, it's a, it's a big problem. I would say, it's I enjoy competing with the best. Uh, I've enjoyed playing tournaments in Russia. Uh, I've also played some really nice tournaments in China. Uh, and obviously China is uh, is not part of the draws world at the moment as well, uh, due to other circumstances. So yeah, I really hope um, there will be peace soon. Um, it's, yeah, the war is just, yeah, just terrible. Yes, absolutely. What is terrible? And do you think it will be possible in the future, in the next few years, for example, even if the war uh, will be stopped for um, Russian playing against Ukrainian players during the tournaments? Because honestly, I can't imagine that. Yeah, it's yeah, it's really a difficult situation, and it's really hard to make the right choices as well. I mean, for instance. Uh, Schwarzman is qualified for the next World Championship. Um, mm -hmm. Should he be allowed to play or not? I would say yes, he should be allowed. But it's very tough to make those decisions, I think. Mm -hmm. And I, I really hope uh, yeah, everybody can play soon again. But I don't know how the world will develop in that regard. Uh, yeah. It's... 
it's absolutely difficult to make decisions during that time and we all hope the world will end soon because the most important fact the safety of people the human lives are most important in in this matter and of course we want the sport at the maximum top level and as you can see many games are analyzed by all from the games against russian players for example and we are going to 10 uh, to 2010 2010 year and your game against the guntis valneris the world champion from 1994 yeah so in the years 2010 and 2011 i i became a very stable player i when i played against grandmasters i would hardly lose any games and i think this game is again not such an interesting game but what's interesting is that it was so easy for me to make a draw against one mm -hmm. of the very best players in the world when I was just 17 years of age. So what happened is that, well, he started with 31-26, but we got into known territory um, very soon because this position usually arises uh, after the most played move and now change, and we have the same position. Mm -hmm. um, so we got into this. And one of the things I added to my game in the years 2009-2010 was opening preparation. And in this game, I more or less called out Guntus uh, for not knowing a somewhat new idea. Because we got here, and here he made a slight inaccuracy. Uh, he played a very logical move, he exchanged to 28. And this introduces this threat. This was actually also seen in the recent uh, Dutch Championship that's being played now in a mm. game be between uh, um, Magiel Wijstra and Emre Hageman. I think it went like this. Um, but I had prepared a nice idea at home uh, playing 1721, which doesn't look that logical, but there's an idea to it. I took two pieces here. He made the most obvious capture. I mean, you can go to 29, but it looks odd. Black can probably just mm -hmm. exchange to 24. And uh, yeah, have a nice central construction. So he took to 28. And yeah, here came the big surprise for him. 914 uh, makes this threat of winning a piece. And yeah, you can avoid it by playing 30-25, but Black will just take the center, have a better position. Mm -hmm. So we had no choice. And this looks strong. He's winning a piece temporarily. But I sacrificed it. And uh, actually, this position is slightly easier for Black to play. Um, yeah, because in the game, this is what happened uh, with an open position, but if anyone has chances, it's probably black because he can develop somewhat nicer, uh, especially uh, play some moves here, take 24. You have no piece on 16, um, so black has somewhat better chances. Um, and if white were to play this, um, the piece on 22 is in just as much danger as, as my piece here. So probably we'll, we will exchange those pieces um, with also a slightly easier position for Black to play. I mean, this is one of the options. And uh, Black has no trouble whatsoever. Mm -hmm. So I was... The reason I wanted to show this game is because in those years I got very effective at... Uh, yeah, keeping the game stable against the top-level Grandmasters. Guntus has a rating of 2400 here. And he just has absolutely no chance to win this game. And it brings me to the question, because you are preparing this opening for this game. And what happens once your opponent just lets you to play something that is prepared by you? Do you play quickly and uh, and showing your opponent that you are prepared for that or you just want to hide it and bluff with your time waiting and calculating that you are inventing something and showing your opponent that you are not so confident about the position um 
I think I was relatively quick in this game. But usually I don't play very quickly, even though I prepare something. Obviously in Blitz games it's different, because then you need the time later on, so you'll just play all these moves. But in normal games usually I take a bit of time. Also just to double check. I mean, you have the time anyway, so... I'm a relatively quick player as well. So there's no need for me to uh, to fire all these moves, <laughs> like in mm -hmm. a few seconds. So I think I spent a couple of minutes, maybe 10 minutes or so, to reach this position. But uh, yeah, there's there's one other game that I will probably show against Schwarzman. Mm -hmm. uh, I can also show it now. We can jump a little bit ahead of the timeline. Sure, um, absolutely. This, I think this also became uh, a very important game later on in my career, because obviously I played two World Championship matches against Schwarzman. And I think for him this game left some scars, so to say, because uh, he got out prepared and ever since I feel like he was very afraid of my opening preparation, while he himself is pretty good at openings. So this game uh, uh, was played in 2013 and um, yeah, this is one of my best successes. Uh, that was the World Cup, uh, World Cup in Wageningen. And uh, it was a knockout system. Uh, you first yeah. had to qualify for the last 16. And from then on, it was just playing, I think, a regular game, rapid game, uh, blitz game, and then super blitz uh, until there's a winner. And uh, that was the time that that system was quite a popular one, also in uh, without knockouts, yeah, of course. But I think also the qualifications were really different. Because I believe even there you had to play a normal game and then had to play Blitz. Yes. So the qualification phase was a bit messy. Uh, <laughs> I, I was playing there in Wageningen in 2013. I remember this tournament and perhaps I remember even this game. Ah, yes. I in, I had a lot of trouble in qualification actually because I lost to Artem Ivanov. Yeah. Uh, so I was almost out in the qualification phase. <laughs> but I managed to pull through. And uh, then I, I think I first played against Ainui Shaibakov, my big rival mm -hmm. from youth. I managed to beat him in probably the Blitz. Then I played against Joel Atze, the champion of Africa. I won in the Rapid. Um, but then came the really big test. In the semi-finals I faced Alexander Schwarzman and in the finals I faced Alexander Georgia. That's right. And uh, yeah, this game was really special because um, I had never won against him, I think. And I knew, okay, we have to play a regular game, rapid game, blitz game, super blitz, if, if all of them become uh, draws. And I had prepared this um, opening, I think the summer before, and I knew, okay, this opening it's interesting, but probably it's only right for Blitz. I did not want to play this in uh, in the Rapid game, for instance, because Schwarzman would have time and maybe he can solve all his problems behind the board. So I knew if I want to play this opening, he's probably one of the players that I can get it against. Mm -hmm. But I also knew, okay, I first have to play the regular game, <laughs> the, Blitz, the Rapid game, then the Blitz game, and then in the in the Georgia Lehman tiebreak, I need to play this new idea. <laughs> so I was waiting the whole day <laughs> to to get this idea on the board. Obviously, I, I had to play well in the regular game as well. But I knew, okay, once we get here, I can probably get this opening, and and then everything can happen. Uh, so this has been Schwarzman's favorite uh, opening move since uh, yeah, as long as I know. Um, and I played the most standard way with white, basically, uh, yeah, black exchanged here with the idea of, uh, at some point occupying 23, and I, with white, tried to get some control in the center as well. Um, so yeah, this position has been seen many times. 
Um, and I myself with Black have also played this, um, at least in some construction, with an entirely different different concept. Basically, luring white to the center, and then tr trying to get a surrounding game. This I have played with Black. But what Schwarzman did is what you most often see, Black wants to play aggressively, um, tries to build this, uh, this formation. And this is also what happened. So I think uh, this position we both had already numerous times in our mm -hmm. careers. Um, especially he must have had this many times. But this is where I prepared the new move. I was just wondering uh, the summer before, like what happens if White were to play this? Why does nobody play this move? Mm -hmm. So I looked at it a little bit and decided, okay, it's not bad, at least. And it has some special ideas behind it. So uh, yeah, I was already looking forward to try it. And this Blitz game, this uh, that, that, that seemed the best option to do it. I think the mm -hmm. time control was three minutes plus two seconds. So I probably had more than three minutes here. And uh, well, this was the moment Schwarzman already had to think. And he spent quite a lot of time uh, figuring this all out. Uh, so this looks like the most obvious reply. This is basically why nobody had ever tried it with White before. Because if White were to play all the moves, he's the first one to take a decision. Um, like if you play like this, this is uh, just very bad for White, probably losing. Uh, because yeah, White has nowhere to go, only here. And... Uh, Usually black wins uh, a piece. Uh, if it were to go like this, this will win a piece for black. Well, a lot of taking. <laughs> yeah. But at the end, that, black has a piece more. That's the, beauty, that's the beauty of drafts, because you start to play and everyone tells you, just don't make gaps, don't make operations of two pieces, don't let yourself uh, to be locked, and then you become grandmaster and you start to play <laughs> oppositely what you have been <laughs> talking, uh, teaching all the time. Yeah, this looks slightly dangerous, but you know. Um, so yeah, White uh, only has one positionally uh, okay move, that's this one. And again, a lot of taking, and now the idea is that uh, this is a strong lock, but obviously you first need to make sure that you don't lose a full piece with white. So the uh, the first point of action is winning this piece back. So that's what I tried. He of course tries to defend his piece, and I have to attack this piece again. Um, so obviously this is a new idea. So he uh, he tries to punish it, I suppose, and goes for the most obvious reply. I mean, black can also play something like this, for instance, and simply uh, give back this piece and try to go for an attack at some point. But he wants to see, okay, what's the idea? So he tries to attack this piece again. I have no choice. I have to go to 24. Now, obviously, I had prepared this position. Um, and this is where you see the first idea of white, if black were to try to win this piece. Like this, white has a good position. Take two, take two. And uh, yeah, clearly white has, has some initiative on this flank. Some nice potential control in the center as well. Um, so, so this is something that certainly in a blitz game you would never play with black. It's just too dangerous and too easy to play with white. So, um, yeah, black can also so wait and uh, try to win white piece later. And that's what Schwarzman did, of course. Uh, but he made the wrong waiting move. Okay. And uh, yeah, if you prepare with the computer, I, I had obviously prepared this variation with the computer. Uh, often what I do is just uh, figure out the main line, I follow the computer moves, 
I check if there are some other possibilities, but the obvious weak moves you don't analyze too much. I mean, um, he played this move, but the computer strongly dislikes it. So I knew, okay, the computer dislikes this move. That's all I knew. But on at, at the board, I still had to figure out, okay, why does the computer dislike this move so much? But the, the luxury I had was that I had over three minutes to figure this out. Eternity, three minutes. Yes, against what you can do in three minutes. Against one minute for him, I knew. Okay, my position should be good. Uh, but I still had to figure out how to play this position. There are some very interesting possibilities, by the way, if he uh, would have played for nine. Because I think this has been played also in regular games after my game, and those games went like this. Um, yeah, and uh, this is basically a draw offer. Uh, so black threatens to win this piece, and now white has this drawing idea of playing this. And the next move you will win your piece back. Uh, so I think there was a game of Anikeyev. I think it was Getmanski Anikeyev, but I haven't checked. Uh, went like this. With, uh, equality. But I actually had prepared another big surprise here if it if the game would have gone like this i would have played this move and this also looks absolutely insane mm -hmm. because i had this nice idea if you were to go here i would change but now i suddenly play this move destroying <laughs> so you would think okay this is just very strange um well, probably i have the same idea here as well uh, to, I can play like this, but I, I remember that I have prepare, had prepared this variation, which is even more crazy. Without a good free move? Yes. Oh. So, and it looks dangerous for Black. Yeah, Black yeah. has no choice, has to play this and introduce the threat again. Um, so white needs to close this hole. Yeah, and now black can win this piece. And this is also so complicated. <laughs> but it helps if you just know, okay, the computer says that this was the best line and I know what's what will happen in the very best line. Then at the board, sometimes you can figure out the rest. So I only knew about this variation. So uh, white obviously cannot take this one. Take here, play here. <laughs> Just, um, my good friend Wouter Sitma sometimes calls this uh, going to the zoo. Like you're just watching uh, monkeys at work and you cannot understand what they're doing. <laughs> <laughs> so at the end of the variation, um, black actually is a piece up. Yes, uh, let's count seven pieces against six of white, but white has a nice plan of going to breakthrough at some point. <laughs> this is the opening preparation. Yeah, th that yeah, this was my preparation. Um, yeah, it, it was even more. Yeah, so this is an option, but this is not a good move actually. So. The preparation was even more insane. I had, all, I had, I was just curious about what could happen in this opening, mm -hmm. and uh, yeah, I just decided to to go for this mess. If you have more time, you know a little bit about it. You have such an advantage in these crazy positions. Mm -hmm. um, so here, the idea is the same to defend this, your piece like this, but Black can first try to. Uh, create some new threats. So first he has this threat, and later he wants to play this move. And uh, here is also a crazy idea: change back. So black goes for it. Now, obviously, this is the most natural move, but this loses uh, due to this combination. Take three. So 
White has to sacrifice his piece. And this was also one of the things I was hoping for. Because um, White could try to defend, uh, Black could try to defend his piece, to keep his piece. Uh, the best for Black is to, to give back one piece. Doesn't really look that logical to me. Uh, and the position is about equal. Uh, I believe this was one of the main lines. Monk is in the zoo, definitely. Sorry? Monk is in the yeah, zoo, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. But here, apparently, white is almost winning. Or maybe even absolutely winning. I'm not, I don't really remember. At least it's very good for white. Because this piece on 30, this is the piece you've won. Mm -hmm. But it's actually a horrible piece because you can never play 12-18 because yes. of this combination. So this was also what I was hoping for. <laughs> so it could go, let's say, 9-13, I believe. This was also good for white. And yeah, it's just very hard to play with black with all these uh, these pieces stuck. The less pieces are on the board, the more strong uh, is the lock. Yeah. yeah. So maybe uh, I believe you can just wait with white and have very good chances. During the game, I I knew how to win this position most easy with white, I believe. But now now I forgot. <laughs> 20 years old, rule knew everything about this. Oh, but I can probably figure it out if, I, if it happens in a game. But obviously now I tell everybody my secret, so it will not happen anymore. Uh, yeah, th none of this happens. He actually uh, went for 3-9, which is also logical uh, to keep this strong piece on 4. Uh, but there's a big problem with this move. That's Now it's possible to go for this. In, in this position after 4-9, it's not possible. Uh, to go for this because I lose my piece on 24. Mm -hmm. I will just yeah run into too many threats. Uh, if I play here, he plays 3-9, next move will be 18-23, and I lose the game. And uh, this is just the same, too many threats. This, this is just uh, winning for black. But after 3-9, I knew this was a bad move, and there can only be one reason, that this now is a good combination. So he had to play 9-14, otherwise his position doesn't make sense if he goes for this. Uh, here I have defended my piece. He cannot attack it, he can attack it but I, I will stop his threats, and uh, this lock should win the game for me. So I had to play 9-14, and I took this combination. And still I was up a lot on the clock. <laughs> and I knew, okay, this should be good for me. It's still holdable for black with precise play. Um, but in the game he did not manage to, to, to find it. Uh, one of the options is this. And this, and now next move you can catch my king. But um, in this position, it's still uh, still you have to play pretty precise with black. White has a nice control. Um, probably play like this. Black can exchange, but he has yeah some weaknesses over here. White is a little bit more active than black, so you st especially in blitz, white should have some chances here. And and first, of course, he has to find all these moves. Yeah. And he was down to one minute and even less? Yes, but also in, uh, in this phase, my time burned down pretty quickly, because okay. I had to find all the right moves, but I, I managed to, so that's also pretty impressive that I found all these right moves in Blitz. So it's it's one of my favorite games, one of my very best <laughs> memories. Not only your, because even Alexei Domchev in the chat wrote, I remember this game, which Rudolf yes. will show now. This game became somewhat famous, of course. Yeah. 
Um, so here I think he had one last chance to catch my king like this. Which looks a bit strange, but it works. I take two and now catch both kings at the same time. <laughs> Which is uh, pretty funny. Uh, but also here white has some chances. White again has this nice control on the swing, black has these weak pieces. Uh, but in the game, he did not manage to catch my king at all. Because it went like this. And uh, yeah, these pieces now block all his caching constructions. So I won the game pretty convincingly. And uh, in this position, he actually lost some time, but the position is completely hopeless as well. But I've always felt that this game uh, was worth more than two points, so to say. He, also, he, he kept having some problems to play against me. According to the match, yes. The first match that you have played in 2018, I know uh, from the sources close to Schwarzman that he was hopeless in beating you. Uh, in the match and uh, I believe he was confident it is impossible to break your opening preparation. Yes, probably. So that was the reason why this game was, was so yeah. important. Uh, Marek in the chat says we will not tell anyone your preparation <laughs> role now. It became okay. a little bit public, <laughs> so perhaps even Alexander yeah. Schwarzman will see it. Uh, all you dear viewers, please remember to mm, click the thumbs up below the video and of course remember to subscribe the channel Draft 10 times 10 If you would like to see more and more in masterclasses like that, and I can tell you that in January this is not the final one, the, not the last one, so we have the big bang in the new year and you will have a lot of more beautiful, great content in this year, so don't forget to subscribe the channel. So we are ready to go to another game. Yeah, so before in 2011 I had also played an important game against Schwarzman. Mm -hmm. uh, because 2011 was the first time I played the World Championship Tournament. And uh, yeah, that was a very important experience for me. Uh, to measure yourself against the world's best players. And uh, Alexander Schwarzman was the only one who beat me in the tournament. He won a very nice game against me, and uh, I took, I think, seventh place. Um, but it was such a learning experience for me, because I knew I wanted to become world champion already from a very young age. Mm -hmm. And in 2011, I learned how far off I was of becoming world champion. Alexander Georgiev won that tournament, I think he had a score of plus six, plus seven or so. Yes. And uh, I had scored plus two. So there was still a four, four, I think he had plus seven. So a five point gap. And mm -hmm. I remember saying after the tournament, I just have to improve everything. <laughs> <laughs> I have to improve my openings. I have to improve the middle game. I have to improve the end game. I have to improve my calculations. But I did start working, uh, especially on my calculations. And uh, yeah, that, that just helped me tremendously. I, I sat down every day, uh, half an hour or so. I worked through all the books of Atutin with the, uh, with the nice uh, positions. You, you see this clock, like yes. you have seven minutes to figure it out. I was already a very strong player, but those, time, those times that he says, oh man, if I sat down yeah. seven minutes for a position... <laughs> <laughs> it is strange, absolutely, at the time. Uh, I thought that, that that was a book for some beginners or mid, mid, middle players, but with this time yeah. control, it was absolutely difficult. But it's still, uh, it still, it yeah, taught me a lot about calculation, just to sit down, do it, and then uh, compare what you've seen with the solutions. It, it helped me so much during my younger years, especially in improving my calculations. That time in 2011, you knew that one day you will become the world champion? In 2011, no. Um, but in 2012, I've selected one game of 2012 as well. That was the first time I thought maybe I can do it. 
uh, because 2012 was the year that I went from Grandmaster level to one of the very best players in the world. I had a very successful year and that all started with the Dutch Championship. Um, I had played it already three times. I showed you 2009 one game. Uh, I did well there, but in, uh, and that year I came close to winning it, but also because Alexander Bayakin was out of form. He, he won the tournament with a, with a score of plus three, but in uh, 2010 and 2011 he was just absolutely amazing. There was no way to keep up with him. He won two very nice games against me, by the way, as well. But then in 2012 I managed to win uh, my first uh, of only two uh, Dutch champions, uh, championship titles. More time world champion than Dutch champion. And I felt like, okay, now my name is in the history books. So yeah. probably I can try to, I have a real shot at becoming world champion as well. If I keep improving and keep working hard. So one of the nice games I played in the championship was against Van Laker. And the game more or less started around this point. Uh, at this point, it became somewhat interesting. He has this construction um, of three pieces. And also he has this piece on six, um, which could potentially become weak. Um, but on the other hand, he has six tempos more. He has some control in the center. So it's a, it's a pretty interesting position, I would say, where both sides have their advantages. Um, so I tried to limit his freedom on this wing a little bit. And uh, this move is aimed at putting some pressure on his wing. So um, another move to put pressure there. And this was the first moment he made a somewhat dubious decision. Um, he played 12-18. And now I can fix his wing. He should have played 14-20. Uh, uh, winning some more tempos in the process and using that I cannot go to 30 because of this winning the game. So I would have to wait one move with probably 47. And yeah, this seems more or less equal to me. Um, white has so, uh, black, black has so many tempos, white has a nice structure. So, uh, should be equal. But he went for 12-18, and now he got into some trouble. So I have this strong formation ready. And uh, yeah, here he has to make some big decisions. I have this uh, obvious threat. And he cannot change like this. Because now I first attack 27. He has to change. And now I prepare to win like this. There's nothing he can do about it. So pro he can play like this, play this. He has to go here. And I win one piece and also the game. So he cannot make this exchange, has to exchange like this. And now I took a, a really nice decision. Um, it looks most normal to take like this, to keep your pieces nicely balanced, both sides of the board of about equal pieces, etc. Mm -hmm. But I went all out for the attack. And uh, yeah, this works out really nicely for white. Black is uh, certainly having some practical issues here. So his main issue is that he's too late to defend um, by going to 23. My attack is just really fast if he plays like this. And now he has to make two moves at once to stop my uh, attack. This is just winning the game. So there's only one way to prevent this attack. Think for this. So he prepared this exchange, keeping him in, in the game. But I had already foreseen this really nice move. 
So I threaten to win the game like this now, and I create some time um, for my attack. And uh, yeah, in the game, he could not find the right solutions for this. He went for this, which is logical, because now if I attack, he will uh, play this sticky move, I think you call it. I have, to, yes. I have to take three, he takes one with a draw. Next you go to king. But uh, I had already foreseen from quite a long distance that I have this very nice move, 4440, which introduces some new threats, uh, mainly this threat. And uh, yeah, it's not so easy to, uh, to make a clean draw here with black. There are actually many options that are somewhat okay. Mm -hmm. uh, the computer will say that's absolutely no problem everywhere. But uh, in a practical game, white right, has uh, decent chances. And uh, the way black has to defend is actually quite similar to the way Jan Groenendijk won, a one, uh, won one game in the Dutch Championship of this year. He won a very nice game against Magiel Weistra. And he also used uh, a maneuver like this with 3-8 where he first uh, made sure his defense was in order and then went for the attack. Because Jeroen van der Acker, he went for the immediate attack like this, sacrificing two pieces, but there's a clear road to king now. Uh, yeah, but he should have played like 3-8 first. And then uh, at the very least, his defense is nicely uh, placed again now and then only then go for this breakthrough. That's what he should have done. Uh, I believe this is also just possible, uh, but in the game I won. Uh, so I also go to King now, and this is where he made the final mistake. Uh, he thought during the game that this end game was losing, but because he's two pieces down, mm -hmm. Uh, but actually, it turns out that this is still a draw. I think he was afraid that if he goes to, let's say, 15 with his king, I will play these two moves and introduce some threats. Uh, because if he simply waits, he loses the game. Um, uh, let's say he goes here, I will catch his king. Uh, sorry, I, I first have to go to 15. And then I can force him to, to leave this diagonal. But yeah, it turns out that after 1318, now it's hard to, for white to make progress. But okay, this is hard to spot. Although it, uh, I must say that this move does feel wrong. I mean, now, now. The, the, the weakness that White has was these four pieces. So now that I can develop those pieces, uh, it's more or less obvious that I will win the endgame. So this was a very important game that I won that year during the, the championships. And uh, I, I, I won this game and uh, this... I, I had a really nice score of plus five going into the last round. Mm -hmm. And Baliakin only had plus plus three. But the problem mm -hmm. was that in the last round we had to play each other. Oh. So And if he beat you, he would be he, in front of you? He would be champion, yes. So, and I had lost in 2010 and in 2011. Both <laughs> years before that year. So, mm -hmm. that's the most nervous I've ever been. I, I knew, okay, this is my shot at becoming Dutch champion. <laughs> <laughs> and I only have to play a draw against the guy that I always lose against. <laughs> <laughs> only. Yes. So I, I was, yeah, I've never been so nervous in my life, but I, I managed to keep that game. I did not play a really good game, actually, but Alexander, he missed his chance. He had a nice position. He did something that wasn't great, and I managed to, to hold out a draw. And... After that game, I knew, okay, if I ever need to make a draw again in the last round, I will easily do it. <laughs> I've been so nervous so, that game, I, I held on. Now I know I can do it. <laughs> uh, 
So that time you were 19, yes? Yes. And about uh, being great in the last round uh, of the tournament, it's absolutely not easy. And uh, we were talking about Alexander Georgiev and his first big success was in Poland, in Lublin, in 1995. Yes, also uh, very young back then. Very young, he was 20 years old, he played amazing tournament and in the last round he played against Guntis Valmeris. Uh-huh. And that was enough, enough for him to make a draw in this game, but he played absolutely aggressive, <laughs> totally crazy game. Uh-huh. And uh, in the end it ended in a draw and he became the European champion. Uh-huh. And that was the great start of uh, his uh, great big career, becoming the Grandmaster and winning 10 world uh, titles. Uh-huh. And uh, Many drafts fans, uh, I believe, miss the fact that we have never had the match between Rul Boomstra and Alexander Georgiev. Uh, do you think uh, satisfied as a player or that there is something that you are missing, like, for example, match against G- uh, G- Georgiev or winning the world title in the tournament and not only in match to be fully satisfied? How do you feel with such possibilities? Um... So let's start with the first question about the match with Georgia. Obviously, I would have liked to play a, get, uh, a match against him, but yeah, unfortunately, it never happened. Um, I think we were close on numerous occasions. Um, mm-hmm. In 2013, I was playing pretty well at the World Championship uh, that he won, of course. Um, but in the final round, Njo Fang won a game against Getmanski and qualified for the match. And I only managed to draw. Um, then in 2015, we had another shot. But again, yes. I was third instead of second. Um, that, but after all, he quit from playing. Yeah. And then, yeah, in. Well, first he. Um, Let's get it straight. He, I pulled out of the match against Jan, of course. Then I played against Jan. In 2017, he was out of form uh, at the World Championship Tournament. Mm-hmm. And then in, yeah, of, then we were supposed to play a match in. Let's get it right. 2021. Yes. Just during the pandemic. Yes, but then because of the pandemics, he did not feel it was right to play. So I, th- yeah, I think there were. Do you have any judgment on his decision, or you just accept it? I was very disappointed, but yeah, what can I do? Um, I, I, th- yeah. It, it, I, I've never heard an official statement about why he withdrew, um, so it's hard for me to comment on it. But yeah, I would have liked to play even during those pandemic times, and I thought it was safe to play as well. But of course you can have different opinions on that. I guess all the world almost uh, had this opinion that it was safe to play, and uh, I tried to contact him and to make some uh, interview about uh, uh-huh. quitting playing the match and uh, he just uh, wrote me back that he is not giving any interviews yes. about that and uh-huh. his final decision. So, so uh-huh. we don't know. But I would what... have really liked to play, of course, against him. I th- I, um, one of my regrets is the World Championship in 2015. I think yeah. had I be- been second there, we would have played a match and it would have been really interesting. I mean, if I if I would have been second in 2013, we would play the match. He would win, I think. I, I wasn't ready. He was so much better. That's the point of view. Uh, but in 2015, I was in amazing form that year. But that was also the the problem for me going into the World Championship because I was afraid that I would lose my amazing form. In 2015, mm-hmm. I became judges champion for the second time. Uh, I almost won Salau Open. I won a very nice game there against uh, Evgeny Vatutin. I won a nice game against Alexander Pressman. Uh, mm-hmm. But I fell short in the last round against Arthur Wolf. I, I had a winning position, but I didn't win. Um, but the fact that I had beaten two Grandmasters there, I also I think I beat Jagas Samp that year. 
So I was doing very, very well. But I, I was afraid that if I tried too many new things at the World Championship, probably I would not get the same results as I had all year. So I played slightly conservatively in the first half of the tournament and I just wasn't winning enough games. And the uh, second half I was actually in great form. But it, yeah, I, I came close. I came till plus five, but I was just spent. I couldn't perform the last round anymore. Uh, I had no energy left. I played a, yeah, I, I did not have any real chances against, uh, uh, yeah, I played against Gam Gambata Ganyarkal in the last round. Difficult to pronounce. Yeah, but, uh, I'm the Mongolian <laughs> Grandmaster. Yeah. Uh, but I couldn't create any chances. And of course, Jan came very close to uh, become a world champion there. Um, but I feel like that was my chance at playing a match against Georgia. I also did because of my own experience in 2011, where I had a really nice start. At some point, I had plus three. And I was just so young and so inexperienced. And I fell back in the second half of the tournament. So I thought, okay, Jan is 17. He has a great score of, I don't know what it was, plus five probably already. <laughs> I thought, okay, he's so young, he must fall back. But he did not fall back. He played amazingly till the end, <laughs> almost won the world title. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I, should, uh, I wish I, if I can do one tournament over again, it would be that one. Because I was in such amazing form all year. And going to the other part about uh, being satisfied with winning the world title in the tournament? Yeah, it would have been nice. Um, but do you need it to be fully satisfied with your career? No, but I think the all-time greats have won both, of course. Um, yes. So, yeah. I think I, I was a pretty good tournament player. I mean, I took th uh, third place three times, so the, uh, I, I, I did well there, but it, uh, yeah, it, it's hard to say what I did wrong in those tournaments. Probably I, I don't play enough position, don't play enough positions to win. I mean, if I'm slightly worse, my first instinct is to try to make a draw. And especially Alexander Schwarzman is absolutely amazing at playing for a win in any position. And uh, yeah. in tournaments, that might really help you if you also play worse positions for a win. Um, in the end, you can have m more more wins, of course. In a, in a match, it will not help. Uh, because if you play a worse position to win, you, probably, you will probably get into trouble because you have such a strong opponent. But in tournaments, it's entirely different. To complete this question, we have a very interesting one from the chat. S is typing only hypothetical question. If the match against Gorgiev would be possible, would you come back from your retirement as a professional one more time to play or not? Uh, yeah, I feel like I, I already did. After my studies, I chose to come back, of course, to play him. Um, so, no, so no, I would not, not anymore. I, I, I also wonder. Um, how how he's doing i mean uh he hasn't played for two years almost and he played in Ulinek, for example in blitz and rapid championship and uh, he was not that strong i guess yes i, I don't know i i hope he's doing well I, I i always enjoyed playing against him i i wish him all the best but no i will not uh, come back yeah, <laughs> I, I did Absolutely. play a mini match against him, but it was only a friendly mini match. In uh, I think it was in 2013 in Dom. It was a nice experience. We played some crazy games, and uh, yeah. in the end, he won. Um, but uh, it it was it was really fun. So fun was the main goal of this match, not the result. Yeah, yeah, that was a friendly match. So obviously. Um, we are going to play interesting games. I, I still wanted to win, of course. I had some chances as yeah. well because he, he was playing some crazy systems. <laughs> but yeah. in the end, still he won. But 
I remember some games from this match of yours. Uh, it was interesting, absolutely. But playing the match for the world title is, I believe, much different because uh, your attitude is different yes. and uh, maybe you just don't take so much risk and, as in those friendly games. Uh, yeah, I, th I think I more or less played my normal game, but he played uh, some, <laughs> some interesting ideas. And I think in a match he would play differently. But I always really enjoyed yep. these matches. Uh, I enjoyed the struggle. I enjoyed also that um, it's just one against one. In a tournament, it's mostly about uh, scoring enough wins. But in a match, mm -hmm. um, well, as long as you don't lose, you're doing fine. I mean, you have everything under control. If you lose, it's your own fault, so to say. Um, so I always really like that. And in a tournament, uh, if, for instance, there's one day you're not feeling so well, but OK, you play uh, one of the guys you have to win against. You simply have to be there that day. In a match, you can more or less pace yourself. You think, OK, I'm feeling well today. I can try to, to play very aggressively if I like. And if you don't feel well, OK, maybe if you if you don't like your position, okay, you say, okay, tomorrow I will try something interesting again. Today it's okay if it's a calm game. So, so from this point of view, if you were one to compare match and tournament and say which one is more difficult, what is, in your opinion? Um, it depends. I think if you're the favorite, a match is much easier because everything is in your own control. But if you're not the favorite, I think, I mean, the, the chances that a big surprise will happen is much greater in a tournament, I feel. I mean, uh, uh, in 2015, Jan was very young and he almost won the tournament. Yes. But I think in the match against me, there was almost no way he could win because there was, I, I was so much more experienced um but in a tournament obviously he can take a higher place than me if he does well against uh, some other guys so I, I feel like if you're not the favorite maybe you have better chances in a tournament because a surprise can happen there but if you're the favorite then you have to pick the match <laughs> so it's better to be an underdog yes. all the time we talk a lot about the past we analyze the past times and situations and tournaments, but uh, also considering uh, something about future, because we all know you decided to stop your professional drafts career. And uh, we, as a drafts community, we don't want top players mm. to, to, to go retired. Uh, and uh, uh, what, because I asked you in yes or no questions if you know what is necessary for drafts and you told me that you don't know, but maybe you have some feeling, intuition, like in the drafts game, what is necessary for the top players to keep playing to attract more people in drafts and uh, making this more and more popular? Do we need better, um, I don't know, like something like streams and a way to get to the people that something like drafts uh, is played professionally? Do we need uh, great uh, money re rewards in the tournament uh, or mm, we have to go to the schools uh, worldwide? What, in your opinion, would be the best for drafts in next years mm -hmm. to, to become bigger? Um, I feel like these are two separate questions. The first question is what is necessary for top players and the second question is, is what is necessary to develop the game more or less worldwide. I would mostly like to comment on my experience as a top player. Mm -hmm. um, what I always felt is that tournaments um, should have the basics right. Um, especially lately, I feel like I've been playing too. Yeah, I've been playing too many tournaments where the playing hole is not really up to standards. Um, I think a playing hall should always have enough space, enough fresh air. Um, those basics should always be right. Another thing that always should be uh, right is the communication to the players. Also there, I felt sometimes that it 
can improve a lot. I've played many tournaments that during the tournament you hear, okay, the price money is this and this, and you don't even know beforehand. So like, I don't really care how much money there is. I just want to know, okay, <laughs> give me a number, <laughs> whether it's 500 euros. Uh, I, I don't know. I don't really care, but it just feels so strange not to know it. And it would also sometimes it's, I would also like to see that every tournament is play, played in a nice playing hole that looks good, where there's at least some thought about how to get in the media or how to get some attention. As I, I would really like to see that those basics are always there. And you didn't feel that all the tournaments just were on the right level? No, no, that was one of the problems I had. I, I, I like the certainty that all the tournaments are up to the standards that I would like. Also, there was so much uncertainty regarding the World Championship matches. I feel like it would really help if there was just someone uh, who's connected to all these matches. There's obviously a lot of experience with all these organizers, but every year there's, or, or most years, there's a different organizer of these matches. He does it for the first time. It's all new and difficult, of course, because the match is a big happening. Um, I feel like, yeah, you can uh, bundle this experience together and uh, make sure that these matches are um, uh, are, are yeah, more certain. Always, uh, at the last time I heard that uh, we will play at these dates and it was quite unsure whether these matches will be played. Yes. Uh, obviously, the, the, the three matches that I played were uh, very well organized when they finally happened. And there were beautiful events. Uh, but the waiting for these matches and all this uncertainty and the last time was even the most crazy. I would play Georgia first, then I would play Pan Yiming. Then I don't even remember. <laughs> I would play Guntas at some point, or he would get approached. Right. Then I had no rights at all. Then I had my rights back. Then I would play Schwarzman. I, I mean, it was just, uh, yeah, too much uncertainty for me. For you as the professional, but it's player, not really. Just... I mean, my decision is mainly because I've always felt there's more to life than drafts, but. Um, the fact that, well, not everything was perfect, that also uh, contributed. Mm -hmm. uh, that, one of the nicest tournaments that I've played in uh, were those elite tournaments in China. It was very professional um, with the other mind sports together with chess, uh, Go, Rich, and uh, Chinese uh, chess. Um, Shangxi, Shang yes. Exactly. In, in, in Dutch we call it Chinese chess. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, but those were, were very nice events. Everybody was dressed appropriately. Uh, you had nice playing venues. Uh, you had nice coverage on the website, on the internet. Uh, I would like to see such elite events for the top players more. Um, but obviously, now that we can't play in Russia or China, it's difficult. Um. So, conclusion to make it professional, well looking, and um, good conclusion will be to cooperate with the experience that's organized. Yeah, I think there's there. a lot of this experience in the draft world. One of my favorite tournaments is Nijmegen Open. Um, mm. And it's one of my favorite tournaments because they just get the basics perfectly right. The playing hole is really nice. It's uh, held in the middle of the summer. It's always really hot outside, but in the playing hole, you know it will be cool. Um, and they have this nice uh, bulletin of, of rounds that are played. You get some compositions to solve. <laughs> and uh, the whole atmosphere is just really nice. So I think there can be more cooperation there. Uh, and, and there are, are more wonderful tournaments. I've played 
last year in uh, Riga as well. It was really nicely organized by Robert. Uh, and I think it would help if all, for instance, all World Cup tournaments, they are in contact with each other. Like, how did you do this? How did you do that? Absolutely. Even for me, the experience that I got from Robert and being in Riga helped me, I know, in making, for example, Polish Open in Poland. And this is something that we need. We need to mm -hmm. cooperate and we need to improve this level. So it's absolutely uh, extra um, to know what is your point of view. Uh, but just, I just don't want to spread too long on this topic. Uh, just one more question, because... What I think that we need to, uh, to that we need to development for the de development of drafts, of course, uh, with bigger scale, it will be easier to uh, bring the resources for the top players, yeah. Because once there is a mm -hmm. million players playing, it's easier to get yeah. the lobby, to get mm -hmm. the sponsors, to get uh, the money, uh, and to make it very, very professional. But on the other hand, we have also the contribution of players. And uh, I will use my Polish uh, colleague, of course, uh, Natalia Sadowska, uh, who is preparing her great website, nataliasadowska.pl, with building the mark, the position of her with great graphics, great, great design, trying to package player as a product and to so show it and mm -hmm. to sell it somehow, yeah, because it can be useful in medias and etc. cetera. Uh, do you think drafts players could... Uh, make more inputs, more contribution to becoming, uh, to drafts for becoming better developed? Uh, yes, of course. I mean, uh, I, th I think, uh, but uh, I think we, we try already. It, of course, it can get better. I think uh, in the Netherlands, we, have, we are part of uh, Team NL. And uh, so, so there's a collaboration with also all the other sports. And uh, I think that also has some potential um, to be part of something bigger. Um, and I like uh, what Rick Gurnages is doing with the Facebook page. Everybody can follow the uh, young top players there. Um, so I, I, I think, yeah, it's, it's heading more in the right direction. So I hope all the players, not only the Dutch ones, will uh, create will create some fan pages. I have seen already from, for example, present uh, on the chat, uh, Domchev, uh, who uh, just were was posting more and more about tournaments. This is something that we need, and this can be some way of appeal to show yourself, to build a community around you, and uh, I believe this is the way to um, bring brighter future of drafts. Rule, do you have still strength for <laughs> make, making some last analyze of the night? Uh, let's see what game would be right for that. Um... Well, perhaps one of my recent games. I mean, uh, uh, we have to do end somehow nicely. So this this is uh, this game has not been covered. That yeah, I mean, this is one of my favorite games from the last match. My my first win against mm -hmm. Schwarzman. I also think it was really important um, because I always had a feeling that the second match against him would be much more difficult because obviously I had a good experience the first match against him but I was absolutely sure I would have learned from it and play better the second match so I knew okay I also have to play much better than the first match that I played against him where I did already pretty well but I think um, I was just a much stronger player uh these yeah i mean in 2018 i was pretty strong but this last match in 2022 it was four years later so i had yes. just gained so much more knowledge about the game in those four years i think i hit my top level in 2022 um and this we had a really long tie break uh, because mm -hmm. we played six rows in the first six rounds. He had some chances in, let's see what it was, game three. I had some chances in game six, but six draws. So we had to play the tie breaks. Then we started out with many draws as well. And finally, I managed to 
win uh, win a game. Uh, yeah, this was also something new that I had prepared. Um, this is hardly ever seen at top level, but yeah, it can lead to an interesting game. And what he did was also one of the things that I more or less predicted. Um, so if he plays 1621, I will sacrifice temporarily. And uh, here we would have this four o'clock construction again. Mm -hmm. With uh, probably a better position for white. Uh, so he changed here, which um, basically asked me the question whether I want to allow this exchange. Of course, I don't want that. And uh, we again get this uh, special four clock construction, <laughs> of which uh, I will look up the name. Mm -hmm. um, and it remains for a while. Uh, but in the end, I decided, OK, I will just go to 36 and make it a normal four clock. And um, yeah, this game was played with 10 minutes, I think, plus what was it? A few seconds per move, but it was for an infinite number of games because it was okay. a George F. Lehman tiebreak. So, with 10 minutes, uh, I think 10 plus 5 it was. <laughs> uh, I think so, but we were both playing quite quickly. Because we knew, okay, maybe we will play four or five games. Um, so that was, yeah, so I tried just to uh, play this four clock structure according to the uh, normal standard way. Uh, and here I basically have my first choice of how I want to continue, whether I want to play uh, 40, 35, or the move that I played. Obviously, I don't want to go here because now he can escape this four o'clock um, with a more or less equal position. Um, so I played this move. Um, yeah, and here you can see that we both uh, were playing quite quickly because had I seen this move before I played my move, I would probably not have allowed it. He can escape mm -hmm. the four clock like this, but it's slightly non-standard, so that's probably also why. I suppose he didn't see it, or he wanted more from the position. I'm not sure. I, I think he just didn't see it, because probably had he seen it, he would have played it as well. And this is just uh, open position. Slightly easier for black to play, but that's only because of this piece. It's slightly unclear where this piece is going. I mean, if it was here, you can s simply build your position. But now it probably will end up on 26 sometime and be slightly passive there. Um, but after 1924, which is uh, a positional mistake, I won a really nice game. Um, not to say that this position is already great for white, but I think white has a lot more potential than black here. You just like. The first game I showed was against Wim van, one of the first was against Wim van der Kooi, and he had four pieces here. Mm -hmm. And I said, those pieces yes. are stuck, you have to develop them. And if you can develop those pieces, then you probably have an okay position. And here, I have only one piece here. So that's absolutely great. I have developed all my pieces there, and I, I can just yeah make this four clock work with these six pieces against uh, uh, the eight of his. So probably it was best for him to change the structure immediately, to change like this um, and change again, just to open the position. Um, mm -hmm. White is slightly better because he has developed this piece. He has a clear plan of trying to t tie down this piece on 29. Um, but I feel like this should be playable for black. He shouldn't be in too much trouble here. He can play this, this, exchange here, and try to stabilize the position. But I feel like Schwarzman is not really the type to to uh, to say early, like, this game is heading in the wrong direction. He just wants to play mm -hmm. according to his plan, so he occupied these two squares, so he would just wants to occupy 23 next, 
I mean, I'm more like the type of player who says early, like, okay, this is not going to work. I will just change now and prevent any further troubles. Not to be escaping from the sinking yeah. ship, yeah. But it's also one of his strengths that he just tries to keep playing, especially in tournaments. Uh, whether the position is good for him or not, he just continues with his plan and tries to make it work. Whether I would just try to make a draw here, probably. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I introduced this threat, but it's not really a threat because he plays 3-9. Um, so if I take it now, he wins back a piece. Mm -hmm. um, but the thing is, I don't have to take it immediately, I can just wait. And uh, yeah, 3-9 makes another weakness as well, but the problem is if he plays 4-9, I will take it. It's equal pieces, mm -hmm. but these two will, uh, yeah, will be threatening, and it uh, looks winning for white. Um, and here I already have a great position. He played 13-19, which is logical. So he keeps this idea. And he wants to go to 23 next. But I played a very accurate move. I went to 33. Now this is prevented because of this uh, shot. So again, you see that um, tactics and strategy go hand in hand. Yeah. So I prevent his best uh, strategical move uh, by using a combination. So here, now he's too late to occupy the square. Has to change the position. He first waits one move, but it doesn't matter. And now he has to break it open. But you already see that it would have been much better if he did it before when he still had this piece on three. Good exchange here. Now. His position is just so weak with all these empty squares. And yeah, the, this construction is worrying as well. Um, I believe 1217 was the better option here. Um, trying to develop uh, like this. Of course, I can exchange here with a good position. That's probably why I didn't do it, but... Um, I think it's easier for Black to fight for a draw here than what he did in the game. But it's always really hard when you're defending, like, in choosing what the, what the, what the best, best option is. It's much easier to pick the best option, because that's you're taught that from the beginning of your career, especially as a top player, like these are the best options if you have a position like this. But to defend well, that's really hard because there are a lot less uh, lessons about how to defend very bad positions like this. It's just not something you can learn from books. You learn how to win all your positions. Only from yes. the practice. And you from have good to calculations, skills, it's really hard to defend well. Especially for top players, because usually they have the good positions. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so yeah, he did not manage to defend properly. Here I played a really good move, except that it wasn't the best. Like if, if it would be on a scale from 1 to 10, I would give this move a 9, but there was also a 10. This, this move would have been winning in all variations. But I saw some nice tactics and went for this move, it looks just so strong. And I was really uh, proud of this move. And, and I still am, despite it not being the best. It's just such a great move. Yeah, there was one better, but OK. Still, still good enough. Well, I wouldn't say it had he made the draw, of course. <laughs> but mm -hmm. it's really hard to make a draw also after this move. After the other move, it's impossible, but OK. And uh, yeah, I won this game in a really nice style. The idea is. Uh, if he plays 9-14, I can win with this combination. And it's also what happened in the game. Yeah. So I took 4. Uh, in the game it went like this, and now he fell for the same trap. But his position was yeah, critical already. Uh, he would 
also after all the other options he would lose, lose a piece at least but there was one option I believe that's just a draw but nevertheless I think this is one of my very best games in which strategy and tactics went very nicely hand in hand and I'm very proud of this game so all the books that are named strategy and tactics in international drafts are so important because you have to connect both parts of the game to become the great player, to become maybe the world champion like Rule Boomstra one day. And that game possibly was one of many um, reasons why Alexander Schwarzman has called you the best match player in the world that absolutely uh, would defeat any player that he would face. Yeah. Cannot and to, say anything. That's if I would like to give advice to some young players or to, to draft players in general, one of the things that always has really helped me is working together. Uh, I've had a lot of trainers, I've had a lot of sparring partners, for instance, Artyom Ivanov, I worked a lot with. And uh, yeah, for me, it, it was always great to work together because first of all, it's much more fun. And second of all, you can learn a lot from the other great players. So uh, if I can give any advice to, to new players, to young players, to, to players that want to improve, it's that, yeah, work together and learn from each other, have fun together. And uh, you can become a great player. Having fun while training drafts is really important all the time. You, once you meet uh, other teammates from KNDB and L, you are having fun together? Yes, definitely. But you have to find a nice balance between fun and uh, really working. If you're only having fun, not then fun. <laughs> you're not really working. <laughs> Then you can go but to if a you party work without fun, that's, that's also not right. So yeah, you have to find a nice balance. Right, like Rule says, you have to cooperate, you have to work together and learn from other uh, players. Like you can learn from the top players in the world during master classes, different master classes on the drafts 10 times 10 channel and uh, having guests like the current world, world champion, what can be better? Nothing, I guess. And I hope that uh, you will just pay back in leaving thumb ups, subscription to the channel and sending now hearts in the chat for rule who has been amazing tonight and showed us a lot of beautiful, amazing ways of preparations, of um, uh, connecting strategy and tactics in his game How um, and showing us how uh, he developed his skills and became the um, world champion for the three times. So please send uh, the hearts on the chat. And uh, Rul, I just want to thank you very much for giving this masterclass. And I do hope it's not the last time here on the channel. And I do hope that during your retirement, uh, the drafts will not forget will forg uh, forget you. Of course, the drafts will not. And drafts players will not as well. But uh, I hope that uh, someday we'll be able to see you from time to time and not only as the viewer but sometimes as a player uh, do you think it is possible to sometimes start in the tournaments and play just not at your maximum professional way that you can uh, prepare all the time yourself but just to have fun with the draft yeah possibly I, I it will be a completely new experience for me to work full time of course but it's obvious I like the game so I will be connected to, to drafts in some way um, mm -hmm. But so we'll have to see in, in what way exactly, but surely you will. Yeah. If, you, if you could imagine right now how you and the drafts will be in the next five years, how, 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 how would it be? Uh, I, I can't really. Time? I mean, it's so much different. Everything used to be connected to improving as a player and suddenly now I have much more freedom. If I would like to spend a whole year making compositions, for instance, it's possible. Whereas, had I done that before, I would have decreased my playing strength. Uh, I also simply like to, to follow all the top tournaments. Um, so, I don't know. Uh, I, I will be connected somehow, that's for sure.
Okay, so about uh, following the tournaments, who will be the Dutch champion 2023? Uh, I, th I think Jan, yes. He's playing amazingly well, so uh, I, I think he will do it. Okay. And who will be the world champion 2023? Oof. Um, yeah, that will put much pressure <laughs> on the one I mentioned. <laughs> I, I think all the Dutch guys are, are doing very well. They had a really good 2022. And uh, mm. yeah, we'll we'll see. Obviously, if Schwarzman can play, he will be a threat. I, I, he he can do amazingly well at World Championship tournaments. So it will be a very nice tournament, and I will uh, follow it. Thank you very much for those answers from my side, and I believe from the side of many drafts players. Thank you very much, Rul, for your beautiful career, for, for your beautiful games, uh, for uh, everything that you have left and uh, contributed to this game, because your contribution is just amazing. And it was a honor for me to co-host this um, uh, masterclass with you, and thank you very much for analyzing all these games. And I want to wish you best of luck, and not only of luck, but just the best uh, during your life, and <laughs> make it beautiful like you have made the drafts work. Thank you for your kind words, and uh, it was a pleasure. Thank you very much, my dear viewers, my dear chat. I hope you enjoyed, I'm sure you enjoyed, and don't forget to subscribe to the channel, Draft 10x10. Have a good night. Bye-bye.